All right, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today, for joining Talent Board and the Candidate Experience Awards. We've got a great virtual conference ahead with lots of great sessions and speakers that you can see on the screen below there. Um, we have, we're gonna be talking about perception gaps in recruiting and candidate experience and lots of thematic threads in and around that theme today. So thanks for joining us uh, with me today is Mr. Ron Mockamer. Say hi, Ron. Hey, hello, everyone. Thank you guys so much for, uh, for joining us. I am uh, super excited for all the great sessions we got packed in today. It's going to be awesome. For those of you who know us at Talent Board, um, Ron has been the global program manager for the past few years, and we're both really excited to have you here today. We've got lots of great content for you um, throughout. We will be taking short breaks in between each of these sessions today, and which here's the agenda for you right now. So again, lots of great content, and we've got some words from some of our sponsors that we wanna share, and then during the breaks as well. So we'll give you a time to get up, get another beverage, use the restroom, check your email, all that good stuff. So that's what the plan is for today, and we again, totally appreciate your time, and we'll show this agenda throughout to keep you up to date with where we're at, and the first session is gonna start in, in just a few, um, probably by, by 12.15 Eastern, 9.15 Pacific. We've got a few things that we wanna share first and while other folks are filtering in on this virtual conference today. So for those who are familiar with Talent Board and the Candidate Experience Awards, we, this is our 10th year we've been doing this benchmark research around the world, asking employers to self-assess what they're doing in recruitment and candidate experience, and then of course, targeting a population of their candidates and getting candidate experience feedback from those candidates. We're gonna talk about this a little bit more too, but Ron, what do you think, 10 years? 10 years. That is incredible, 10 years, and uh, we're excited to, uh, to have this, this awesome celebration this year for the 10th, uh, 10th year doing this. Absolutely, and we hope all of you out there, the organizations big and small across industries consider participating in this program. We're gonna talk a little bit more about it. Again, we're all about elevating and promoting a quality candidate experience. Um, we're the first nonprofit research organization to do this. Every year, again, we do this research with companies big and small across industries around the world. and. It's also, you know, we do this through the industry benchmarks that highlight accountability, fairness, and business impact, especially on your businesses and your brands. We want to thank all of our current sponsors. We're kind of in kind of in the tail end of our 2019 year, although 2020 has started. Um, we're changing to the calendar year this year, but we want to give a shout out to all of our current um, sponsors and thank them for their support of this program. Without them, we would not have this program. So. We want to give them a shout out. And here's a, a word from the talent board. So take a listen. Hey everybody, Kevin Grossman, president of talent board and the candidate experience awards. It is that time of the year. The 2020 candy benchmark research program is now open for employers to participate around the world, from North America to EMEA to APAC, and now Latin America as well. So for all you HR and talent acquisition leaders and your teams wanting to better understand how your candidate experience compares to organizations big and small across industries around the world, and also for you to better understand the perception gaps from what you're delivering and recruiting from pre-application to onboarding, versus what your candidates are actually experiencing across a variety of writing scales that are also easily converted to Net Promoter Score. We hope your organization participates in 2020. And for more information, go to thetalentboard.org. I know who that guy is. You know who that guy is, Ron? Uh, some crazy guy, right? Some crazy guy loves candy. <laughs> crazy candy guy. So that's great. Well, that's, that's, that's a little bit about the program. So the program is open now, folks. It's confidential and anonymous benchmark research for you as well as your candidates because we do not capture any candidate contact information in our benchmark research. There's no deadline to start, only to finish. These are the deadlines for all the regions. So there's plenty of time, but obviously the sooner you start, the better to make sure you get through all the different parts of the research program, the employer part, the candidate part. 
So it's really not a lot of time or investment. It's really a little investment for a big return. It's a $500 registration fee, one-time registration fee for you as an organization, about three to four hours of your time overall um, over the course of, of this particular benchmark research program, and then only minutes for your candidates. Uh, and in return, you're gonna get, again, all this, your data back, you're gonna get the, the anonymous and, and uh, aggregate feedback from all the other companies that participate. You're gonna get one-on-one -on -one time with us. You're gonna get access to our partner program, Surveil, where all your data is held and where you can then have some pretty heavy lifting filtering tools to slice and dice your data even further. So lots of value, big return for a little investment. And we talk, we're, we're really helping companies more and more understand that your perception gaps from what you feel you're delivering in recruitment and candidate experience for both external and internal candidates alike for that matter, from pre-application to onboarding, and then what your candidates actually are experiencing and what their overall perception of fairness is and their po positive and negative sentiment based on what they're experiencing. So that's a, a really more and more of a bigger focus that we're going into now. These are the key competitive differentiators that we see every year in our research. Some of you I'm sure out there have seen this before, but they hold true nearly every year globally. More consistent communication with your candidates, setting better expectations about the recruiting process throughout, what's gonna happen before I apply, after I apply, if I make it to screening and interview, if I get the offer, Asking your candidates for feedback as well as providing feedback, especially to those final stage candidates that um, you're going to still not hire at the end of the day, which again, the majority of people that go through your process, as you all know, is are not going to get the job. We're in the business of no, unfortunately, in recruiting. So there's a much higher volume of people you're rejecting versus hiring. So their experience is critical and, and impacts your business and your brand. Being more transparent and accountable in the process and just having an overall higher level of perceived fairness in the process at the end of the day is what we're talking about with Talent Board. Quick glimpse at some data that I thought would be interesting to share. This is in North America last year in 2019. The, the employer's perception by NPS score, by net promoter, versus what the candidates actually said they experienced. And you can see where the gaps are. And um, the gaps really are across the board. The not selected gap, which is the rejected candidates, that's always the biggest gap and that's gonna be there no matter what. Because obviously when you reject a candidate, there's always gonna be a negative skew. But there definitely is a separation between perception of what employers think and candidates think from research to screening and interview. And then a little bit of a reverse when you get to onboarding in North America that employers rated themselves a little bit lower than what the candidate said they actually experienced. Part of that's the halo effect, right? The candidates get hired and um, they will rate higher usually on that relate. Then if we get to the EMEA journey, again, you can see some of the same similar gaps um, across the board from the front end of the process. And then it flips a little bit again on the offer on board. This is for EMEA uh, content or the surveys from 2019. So some variance, but similar pattern is and the same with APAC as well, where you can see some of those gaps. Um, and then Latin America for the first time where we uh, captured a little bit of data this last year. And again, these are all net promoter scores with how employers rated themselves versus their candidates. And a little bit, lots more variance here, but again, similar pattern overall. What we see every year with the perception gap. So that's a lot of what we're helping companies understand now. So a couple more words from our sponsors and then we are gonna dive in to the first presentation. So thanks for hanging in there. Surveil is a powerful tool for automatically gathering and analyzing candidate experience feedback at every stage of the hiring process. Surveil's candidate feedback makes it easy to optimize your recruiting efforts from how effective your career site is to how well hiring managers perform during interviews, to why candidates accept or reject your offers, and much, much more. Imagine getting real-time feedback from candidates about hiring manager interviews, or from hiring managers and recruiters about the hiring process for each requisition. That's powerful data for optimizing and aligning your entire recruiting process. From application, to phone screen, to interview, to offer, to first year of employment and beyond, you'll know exactly what's working and what's not with your recruiting efforts. 
Call or email us today for a full demonstration of how Surveil can transform your organization by listening and engaging both candidates and employees. Surveil, your candidate satisfaction platform. Yes, and they are the platform that powers the candies. So that's, we're really thankful for them. And here's another word from another sponsor. Hiring will never be the same with Modern Hire on your side. In October of 2019, Montage and Shaker International joined forces to create Modern Hire. Our all-in-one enterprise hiring platform enables you to continuously improve hiring results through a more personalized, data-driven experience for candidates, recruiters, and hiring managers. The Modern Hire platform combines trusted science and technology to predict performance, ensure fairness, and automate workflow enterprise-wide. It includes AI, predictive analytics, assessment, interviewing, and scheduling technology in a single SaaS solution that integrates with leading HCM systems. Discover how Modern Hire is helping hundreds of global enterprise brands, including 47 of the Fortune 100. Improve hiring experiences and results at modernhire.com. All right, folks. Well, we are now ready for the first session. And, and by the way, just in case you were wondering, we are recording this virtual conference. We will also break it up into its segments in the sessions and also make that available to everybody who attends and to the public at large after this event as well. So, but we super appreciate you being here live. And remember, we're giving credits away. How many credits are we getting today, Ron? Three credits for Sherman HRCI. There we go, for Sherman HRCI, there we go. So thanks for joining us. So um, this is again our agenda. And so Ron, who, who do we got first? So first up, we're super excited. We have Tim Sackett, uh, president of HRU Technical Resources and uh, HR Recruiting Industry Blogger. And uh, he's gonna be talking for the keynote session, um, why do candidates still think we suck? Which. Uh, I think it's a great presentation. So. Absolutely, and we love Tim. All right, here we go. Thanks, and here, thanks for being here, Tim. Hey, everybody. Thanks uh, for that introduction. We're going to get right into this. Um, why do candidates still think we suck? Um, they already told you about me, so I don't have to go in through that. Except they didn't tell you about my dog Scout. He is the number one animal in my life, and my wife actually got me. Um, a professional photo shoot, talk about first world problems. Like I'm the hardest guy in the world to actually, um, you know, buy a gift for. And so she, I came home from a business trip and she's like, she was so excited. She's like, for your birthday, I got you this professional photo shoot with a dog. And I'm like, oh, come on. There's no possible way you can make me go on a professional photo shoot with a dog. And we had so much fun and the pictures were awesome. And I recommend now everybody that has a dog or a cat or whatever you have, you should go out and get a professional photo shoot. Um, and one thing they might not have really told you about was I'm the world's foremost expert in workplace hugging, which is super creepy. But if you Google Tim Sackett and workplace hugging, you'll get to read those rules. Um, it's kind of fun. And, um, and I get a lot of, uh, a lot of flack over that. And I'm, I'm known as a hugger for sure. So, why do candidates think we suck? <laughs> and this gets into this whole perception versus reality, right? Sometimes we believe we suck maybe way more than candidates think we suck. Um, but it's, it's definitely one of those things that we know. Like when we talk, even though I will tell you, like right now in this day in history, February 20th, which happens to be my 50th birthday today so you guys can sing me happy birthday I'll, I'll wait go ahead um we've never been better at candidate experience than today and, and it keeps getting better every single day but when you talk to candidates they don't necessarily feel that and part of that is is the perception versus reality thing right we so we might not as suck as 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 much as we think we suck based on you know how these candidates continue to kind of believe what, what we are. And I, and I love these two photos of, of a Mickey Mouse and a regular mouse and how Mickey Mouse is loved, but we would step on the regular mouse that was running through our house um, or the island where, you know, someone thinks they're safe and the other person thinks they're safe. It's, we definitely have this issue 
when we talk about candidates and, and how we deal with candidates. So we have that kind of new suck smell. And it's, it's that whole, I would say it's the 80-20 rule, right? We tend to take criticism of what we're doing at a much higher level than the good stuff. We're probably doing a lot of good stuff. You know, um, we probably changed so many things that are making us better at how we, we deal with candidates and treat candidates. And yet, and we might even come back and might, might say nine out of 10 candidates think we're awesome, but it's that one time that a candidate comes back and says, you suck, then we feel like we really suck. Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. Um, I, I speak at like big conferences and stuff and you get feedback back and I'll have a couple of hundred people like provide like one sentences and, and I will say like 99% of the comments are always like, oh my gosh, this was so good. And then the one person will say, I didn't get one thing out of this presentation. And you're just, you take it to heart so bad. And I will tell you, we tend to do that around candidate experience as well. And so why do we do this? One is I think sometimes we have unrealistic um, comparisons, right? We're comparing ourselves to uh, an organization or a company that might have a hundred times, a thousand times the resources we have, um, or they might just be so much farther along in their candidate experience journey in terms of how they're building this stuff out. And, and we're just starting. And, and so, you know, I always call this like the Google dilemma. People, like you'll have your executives come in and they'll go, well, you know, why don't we interview just like Google? And you just want to go, we're not Google. Like, they spend a billion dollars on talent acquisition. We spend a hundred. Like, can you, so like we're, we have to ensure that we're not basically kind of doing some of that stuff. Um, like I said before, maybe it's actually that we don't actually don't suck that bad. Maybe we're actually pretty good in the overall comparison to things, but you know, we still want to get better. Um, I always think too, that we have to really focus on and understand what is the data say and, and, the, and understand that we're never going to be, we're never going to be 100%, but what, so then are we okay with 60%? Oh gosh, maybe not. Like we should, you know, be way better than that. So I think we have to really understand what does the data say about the comparison subset of what we're trying to become? And then, you know, do we trust what people are saying? Um, it's one thing if you have a candidate who is just, um, you know, coming out and blasting you in some kind of a survey format or whatever. Um, but do we, do we really know, do we really trust? I always tell people, um, if you really want the feedback, great feedback, don't ask your friends, don't ask that your loved ones, because they're going to go, oh my gosh, whatever you're doing is amazing. And you look amazing. You need to find that person that hates you and then ask them because they're not going to sit there and go, oh, you suck. They'll actually give you like actually fairly good critical feedback because they kind of want to hurt you a little bit because they hate you at the same time. Like they, you know, they're not just going to come out and do that. Like think about the person in the office that hates you. We all know who that person is. If you would ask them for feedback, they're going to still act professionally and give you great feedback. I think we have to do the same thing when we talk about candidates is what's a candidate that we know, maybe they didn't get the job maybe they did get the job. Maybe, you know, they, we know they're going to be critical, but in a way that we can trust what they're going to say is going to be really good. Um, you know, one of the things that we really have to understand is that we'll never make 100% of candidates happy. And if, if that's your goal and, you, and your executives come to you and say, this is the goal, 100% of candidates are satisfied with our experience to whatever measure we have, that's unrealistic. It's just not a realistic goal because you can't control that behavior of all the hundreds, thousands, and maybe millions of candidates you might have, depending on the size of your organization. There are some candidates you will never make happy no matter what happens in that experience. They could come in, they could get the job within 13 seconds. You're going to actually pay them a hundred times more than what they're asking for. And they can start whenever they want and they don't even have to show up to work. And somehow they're still, you know, not going to be happy. And they just want to watch the world burn. I think, you know, the key is, is having really high confidence in what you're doing and what you're creating and keeping an eye on the, what the data is telling you about that, right? The measures that you've set, the goals that you've set, not necessarily all the verbatim stuff that we get involved in um, because that becomes really, really difficult. So let's get into this. <laughs> let's get into really why do candidates 
think we suck. And I have a number of these um, that I want to share, and I think you'll you'll recognize them immediately. First and foremost, it's the unrealistic expectations that I think candidates put on us in, in what we're doing. And sometimes we put some of these unrealistic expectations on ourselves, sometimes even on hiring managers. Um, you know, for about a decade or so, the SLAs, the service line agreements between talent acquisition and, um, and the hiring managers and then candidates and in, in, in talent acquisition and all of these kinds of kind of contracts we wanted to kind of make with each other, sometimes set unrealistic expectations you know, or when we first set them, they were realistic, but then quickly they become unrealistic based on business scenarios and different things. You know, I just think it's, it's, we, it's one of those things where we have to ensure that the expectations are properly set um, and that we're, we know we can deliver what we're going to say we're going to deliver. I think that's one of the biggest things, right? It's the whole, it's the whole concept of are we over-promising or delivering or are we under-promising, over-delivering in the psychology behind that? If I tell a candidate, you will have feedback within 24 hours, can I really deliver on that 100% of the time? And if I can't, should I tell them, you'll, you'll, you're definitely going to get feedback within five business days? And you're like, well, gosh, Tim, geez, like, <laughs> that seems like a long time. We should always be able to do that. Well, good, because that's what we want to do. And if I tell them that, hey, I talked to you on Monday, by Friday for sure, I'll have feedback for you. and but on Wednesday, I give them feedback. They're like, oh, wow, oh, gosh, that's, that was quick. They must be interested. There's a, another psychological lift there by making sure that I'm leveraging the right expectations versus unrealistic expectations. The problem is candidates think we suck because too often we give them unrealistic expectations. We call them, we tell them that a hiring manager is, you know, and insane over finding this, filling this position, and getting it done. They need it filled three months ago and you're the perfect candidate and we're going to move fast on this. And then they hear nothing for seven days. <laughs> and so we do things like that all the time where we're setting unrealistic expectations. We're consistently inconsistent. Candidates continue to get inconsistent candidate experience when they apply for the same positions. I'll have myself and I'll have my brother who let's say does the exact same thing. Like we're twins, we're twin engineers, we both work at Google, we're applying to Facebook. I'll apply to the, one, the same position and somehow that re recruiter who gets my resume treats me one way or puts me through a process one way, but then my brother actually doesn't get any feedback or is put through it in a completely inconsistent way from what I was. And we, we tend to think that people don't share, talk or understand what that is. So. We're not being consistent. Now, again, there's no possible way you're going to be consistent with all of your positions. I think we have to understand as we bucket out certain levels of position, maybe high volume hourly, um, mid-level career, um, super hard to find, you know, stuff. Are we treating those individuals in those segments of positions, you know, the same over time? Um, and so I think that's one of those, those process things that we really have to figure out to answer we, we screw this up by thinking one, one process is going to work. It's not going to work. We're going to have to have multiple processes based on what's actually deliverable. But then we, once we do that, we determine it's two processes, three processes, four. Don't go crazy and have 100. But whatever that manageable number is, are we then going to be able to, you know, actually deliver on those in a consistent way? Because that's, that's really critical. Candidates don't understand why it takes so long for us to make a decision. I mean, it's sometimes laughable um, how long it takes when they have dedicated, they went through and jumped through our hoops. They showed up for, an, I had somebody yesterday actually tell me that their process was eight interviews and they were asking me if that was too many. And I'm like, and you know, the, the proper answer would be, well, it depends, right? Like, like, let's talk about that individual scenario and why would you need eight interviews? The reality is, heck yeah, eight interviews is ridiculous. There's no possible way. But then what happens is we, we ask candidates to go through and jump through these crazy processes that we put together in terms of selection and they do the assessment and they, they you know, stand on their, you know, one foot for five minutes and turn around in a circle and then we go, okay, thank you for doing all that. We're going to be back with you soon. 
And then what they don't understand is we're also working with two other candidates and then that candidate went on vacation and then that one was sick and had to reschedule and we were flying one in and all of a sudden it's three weeks later and they're like, what the heck is going on? It should never take you that long to make a decision on me. Now, either you want me or you don't want me, but why has this become this issue that takes so long? And I think that's one of those things that even if you just said, hey, you're one of three, you were the first one. It's get, again, this is it gets back to that kind of you know the, setting the expectation of we know it's going to be four weeks from now, and we totally understand that that you might not be able to wait that long. You probably have other things, or if you're currently in a job and you are willing to wait, you know I'm going to I'm going to tell you that every week I'm going to send you on Friday an update email. Just and the update might just be I don't have an update, but I'm going to give you that. But the reality is, is we just make people wait way too long for most things. Most candidates and hiring managers, when you, if, if you, they're going through the process and let's say there's five people they're getting to interview and they interview and they're like, interview Tim today at one, um, he's a definite no. And we then, we wait though for the entire process before we actually start telling those people to say, you know what, Tim, thanks a lot. We really appreciate you coming in. You're a no. <laughs> we're we're going to move on. Um, and, you know, maybe there'll be something else within the company or, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to you at you know, another time. We have to be able to move those people forward. Here's another piece I think is of why candidates think we suck is we didn't add any value to their life, but we definitely took value away. And, you know, I love Seth and I love like just how he like really compartmentalizes a lot of the stuff. Uh, he's, I, I write every day, but Seth like writes one sentences or one paragraph and adds in that same value not adding value is the same as taking it away. Within our candidate experience for most candidates, we ask them to give us value, give us your time, give us your brain power, give us all of these things. Put your career at risk by leaving your job at two o'clock on a idle Wednesday to come interview and make up a story of how you're going to the dentist or whatever we do. We take value away from them. But then after they go through that, we're unwilling to give them any value in return. And it doesn't have to be the job all. Sometimes it's like, you know what? Based on the interview, based on the questions, here's the feedback that I have for you. Here's what I want to deliver to you because this is going to give you some value moving forward in your life, your career, the next time you interview. And traditionally it was always like, no, God, don't say anything because they might sue you based on what that feedback is. Well, I'm not telling you to say, hey, we didn't hire you because you were a woman. Like, that's ridiculous. But you might say, hey, based on the interview process and, and the, those that we interviewed, you came across really well. There was the two candidates, though, that had more experience in this and this and this. And, you know, if you really, you know, want to come work for us and we really would love to have you come work for us, here's something that you should, you know, work on increasing. And then let's talk, uh, you know, a year from now, let's talk two years from now, um, because we, you know, we do definitely think that you're somebody in the future. We'd love to have you add to the team, um, but we're not, we're not giving them that value. We're not spending that time. And so that becomes one of those issues. Here's the thing of why candidates think, still think we suck. <laughs> candidates believe they're the best candidate. Every single candidate believes when they interview, I'm the best candidate. I'm the best candidate that you're going to interview. But you didn't give them a chance to show that they were actually the best candidate. And, and they're frustrated by that. They're like, they went in there, you asked me a bunch of questions that really never allowed me to show you that I was the person that I think I am for you. And I think that's why we see a lot of interview processes and a lot of hiring managers have gotten really comfortable um, in, in terms of the best practice of asking when you think of yourself right now for this position, for this company, for me working with, with me and our team, is there anything that I didn't ask that you need to share with me? Is there anything that you want to share with me that's going to show you that you're the best candidate for this job as kind of like a, a wrap up end to the interview and making sure those individuals are saying, Hey, did you, did you get the chance to show them you were, you were the number one candidate? Because most candidates believe they are number one. I mean, say, I would say almost a hundred percent. And yet, when they leave the interview process, they never got the feeling like they were actually the best candidate for the job. Another reason is that 
<laughs> quite simply, we just aren't being friendly enough to candidates. I, uh, Pulp Fiction, this is from Pulp Fiction, and um, it's a dog's kind of personality, and a personality goes a long way. And he was talking about why um, he's like, hey, do you want a piece of bacon? He's like, I don't eat pork because I don't, you know, appreciate an animal that will roll in his own feces or whatever. And he's like, well, in that case, then you wouldn't appreciate a dog. And he's like, well, a dog's got a personality. A personality goes a long way. I will tell you a friendly candidate experience goes a long way with candidates and yet we, we tend sometimes to be so caught up in the process so caught up in what we're doing that we don't show a friendly personality to the candidates we show either just a a, a level straight kind of not not friendly not mean we're just kind of mid like very kind of cold per, you know impersonal i would say uh business-like which you would think would be fine but we're talking about a candidate experience and what they what they really view, and so they, it, uh, that impersonal business like sometimes comes across as you know actually unfriendly and, and somebody that you know a process or an experience that we wouldn't want to work with. And so for me again, why do candidates think we suck? Yeah, we we just we're, we're not very good at being nice to them um, and understanding how stressful it is to go through that process that we've, that we've asked them to go through. Recruiters tend um, not to want to show empathy to candidates. Um, and, and again, some of this is old school, hey, there's some legal ramifications, right? Like I know when I was first trained in being a recruiter, especially in a corporate environment, I, I was always told never say you're sorry to a candidate. Never show them any kind of sympathy. And, and, and even don't even show them empathy, right? It was always like, it's not your fault. They didn't get the job. I'm like, well, yeah, but think about what a candidate is doing when they, enter, when they actually apply to come work for you. What they're actually saying is, I love you. <laughs> I want to come work for you. I want to come work for that job, for your company. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm asking you to accept me. And what we're doing when they don't get the job is rejecting them and rejection sucks at every single level so we should be empathetic we should have sympathy for those candidates going through they're much more likely to have a positive reaction to candidate experience if we're sympathetic to them not getting a job that they truly wanted and yet we're trained to be the like these unfeeling soldiers and going you know, not even, I was going to say, I was going to say, sorry, you didn't get the job. We don't say that. We're like, Hey, Tim, just wanted to let you know, we've gone with another candidate that just had more experience than you and keep trying, you know, and the candidate's like, Oh, that sucks. And you're like, you know, it does suck. Really liked you. And I really hope you continue to come back and apply again. I think the hiring manager really liked you. Now, if that's not the truth, definitely don't do that. Just tell them like, Hey, how you manage you thought you sucked. Please go away and never come back. That's a joke. We wouldn't say that. Maybe we would if the person was annoying. Um, the problem with candidates, um, it, it, we, this is a little bit of they want it to be personal, like I just said, and we want it to be business. That's problematic to candidate experiences. It leads to them feeling like, you know, we suck, you know. I'm I'm giving you everything I have. I'm throwing my heart and my brain and all my feelings on the table because I want to come work here. And you've just totally told me no. There, there's also this happens. Now I call it the CEO's nephew dilemma. And when we tend to think about bad candidate experience and why someone thinks we suck, like I said, it's usually a very small number of the people that apply to our jobs. And so when I worked at a big health system. I had the CEO's, you know, I love this, the CEO's wife's sister's son. So I think the CEO is somebody that I'm kind of reporting up to. His wife has a sister. She has a kid and that kid needs a job. So what happens, right? Kid applies for the job and the sister of the CEO's wife like, tells him like, hey, Johnny applied for the job. Make sure that, you know, everybody knows. And so we go through that, right? Um, you know, the uncle, the CEO, basically, you know, has to, you know, make sure that everything happened correctly. And the reality is, is 
you know, you go in, you apply to the job, kids, you know, has no experience, isn't going to get a job in there. We have nothing for them. We go through the process. We automate out like the thanks, no thanks kind of stuff. Um, and this was for like an hourly position. And basically, you know, the, the wife and the sister and everybody get together and they're like, Johnny didn't hear a thing. And all of a sudden the CEO comes walking down the aisle, right? Walking down the hallway, come into your office, all ticked off going, what the heck? Why didn't my nephew hear from you guys? And we could go through and show him like here, he did hear. But what happened was he actually didn't hear, right? He actually got an automation response, which we were thinking, oh, well, that should be okay. But that's what we know is automation. Sometimes they don't feel like that is. Plus, we also have the internal referral kind of candidate, which tends to have a little bit more. We need to like treat them with the kid gloves, give them a little bit more love than we would maybe an external. If we're if we if we want to try to eliminate that risk of having a negative experience. So this one happens all the time with internal kind of referrals. The, the CEO, when they refer somebody, it just gets ramped up to a whole different level. So we suck <laughs> because we tend to really suck at providing closure feedback that leads them to believe they still got a chance. And, th and this happens all the time where we're going, oh my gosh, um, you interviewed so well and we show somebody else, but man, I just keep applying and and we really think you got a shot and they're just like, all right. Like, and they just keep coming back, keep coming back. And eventually they'll go, Hey, wait a minute. This sucks. I didn't get the job. Um, and I'm not getting the job and you guys keep telling me to apply and you guys suck. So we have to get really good about being, having better at closure feedback saying, Hey, I understand there were some deficiencies. Um, and, you know, and here's what you would have to do if you really want to get that job the next time and give really good feedback. Again, very labor intensive to do that sometimes we, and we just don't, we run out of that. I think almost all candidates, if we set the right expectations, if they have a lower expectations, then, then we can do it. The problem is, is we want to do the basics really well, right? So what do candidates really want? Did you get my application? Do you want me to interview? If not, why not? If yes, when? They get the job, why or why not? And then basically, is this the end, right? Are we done? Like, if you can deliver that, 90% of candidates would be completely fine. We're talking to those other ones, right? And so I think, so the kicker is, you know, what they want to know is they want to believe like a real person is actually telling them these steps. So you can use automation. You can use a chat bot in, mo in most organizations are right now. But if you are, it still has to feel like it's coming from a real person. If it feels like it's not, then, then we run into some issues. And, and I'll tell you right now, automation, having a chat bot, all of these things is really great. But we have to think about the psychology of this. If, you, if somebody applies to the job and they get an automated email or an automated chat bot response or an automated text or something like that, and it happens within one second of them applying for the job, they know that that's automation. They know that's technology, that it's not real. If you would say like, wait one hour and 27 minutes and all of a sudden sent the person and said, hey, we just got your application for this position. Thank you so much. We're sending this on to the hiring manager or we're looking this over for this position. We'll get back to you soon. The person from a psychology standpoint is going to be going, oh crap, they're, they're really looking at it. Like it's been an hour and 27 minutes since I applied to that job. It wasn't 13 seconds after I applied that I got the automated response. And so again, think about what that would make them feel like. If you're going to use automation, that's great. Use automation, but do it in a way psychology wise that it actually feels like it's coming from a real person, like it's a real process that's there. So what I want to like, and I love Hamilton. So I give this a quote from Hamilton. If you haven't seen Hamilton, go see it. I've seen it five times. I love it. One last thing before we get out of here. I want to talk about what does the crowd say? So I went out and crowdsourced a bunch of candidates live, literally like this last week, and said, why do we suck? At, as, 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 why do we suck at candidate experience? Why do candidates think we suck? And so this is ranked in terms of the top five that I got from literally hundreds of people. Um, and so number one, too long. We talked about that, right? Definitely too long. 
we have to be able to move faster in terms of the feedback we're giving. Number two, on-site experience didn't make them feel welcome. Oh boy, that's an entire you know, session on itself is how do you create an on-site experience that makes them feel welcome and wanted. Number three, they felt like a number. It was compliance over actually delivering experience. So how do we make them not feel like a number, not feel like we're just trying to be compliant and dot I's and cross T's and make sure we don't get ourselves in trouble. Number four, they didn't get any feedback at all black hole. So we hear that consistently the black hole thing becomes a major problem that we're trying to fix. And then number five, being ghosted. Now, that's working both ways right now. Ghosting is a major problem. And, but I think candidates feel like we get, you know, we ask them for stuff. We make them jump through some hoops. And then, the, you know, as a recruiter, we send the candidate over to the hiring manager. And then the hiring manager never moves on it. They decide to close the position. Um, they like other people and we're just too busy to get back. But we, they feel like they're being ghosted. So top five, too long. On-site experience sucks. Felt like a number didn't get the feedback, black hole, or they were being ghosted. That, my friends, is why candidates think we still suck. Like I said, though, we've never been better in the history of candidate experience than we are right now, and we continue to get better every day. Keep pushing it forward. Keep continuing to try to figure out ways, small ways, big ways, that we can move this forward and make people feel better. I have really quickly... You can get, I, I, did, I did an ebook that just got launched, Seven Big Ideas for Finding More Talent in 2020. You can go to gettalk.app forward slash fix it. You can download that right away. Also connect with me on the Twitters, on LinkedIn. I'm a huge connector. If you have any questions, please feel free to send me those. I have a great idea on how to get, um, how to help you from getting candidates to stop ghosting you. So if you want to reach out to me and ask me for that, I'll definitely send you those tips. You can also buy my book called The Talent Fix. That's on Amazon. And of course, hugs to you all. Thank you so much for me today. Enjoy the virtual conference. I hope you guys get a lot out of it. We'll talk to you soon. Hey, everybody. Wow. You know, I'm telling you right now, um, I think Tim distilled nine years of candidate experience benchmark research in this 30 minute presentation. Now that doesn't mean, right Ron, that they, we still want everybody to download our research and read it. Everything's free on our site as well. All of our resources, research articles, the list goes on, but that was just a, a fantastic webinar, don't you think? I think so, and uh, on his birthday too, how cool is that? Happy birthday, Tim. I know, happy birthday, Tim. Absolutely, so folks, if you've got questions for Tim, or for us, or anything related to this virtual conference, send them to support at the talentboard.org. That's how we're gonna manage this today. Um, again, we are recording the entire virtual conference. We will be breaking it up and providing it to you. You will get access to it all as well, and we appreciate you coming today. So just know that uh, that's what we're gonna do. So if you've got questions, send them to the support at the talentboard.org. So we've got, we're gonna take a little bit of a break right now. We've got a couple words from our sponsors and then we'll be right back in a couple minutes. Thanks. I'm classic, fantastic, abracadabra, I'm magic. And I'm sending out these good vibes and electric waves. Take a ride with me and we're walking on these golden rays. Ain't anything like you've ever seen before. I'm everything and more. I got to show you what I'm all about. I got something. For you, just watch how I do it. Let me show you what I do. What I do, just watch how I do it. Yeah, this is how I do it. How I do it. I got to show you. Let me show you what I do. What I do, just watch how I do it. Yeah, this is how I do it. How I do it. Just watch me. Watch me how I do it. Hey! Watch me how I do it. Hey! Candidate experience with today's software is atrocious. How we can change that was kind of the idea behind Paradox. The technology should help work for us. 
and the idea of if we had an assistant to help us get work done, what would we want that assistant to do? What we really got stuck on is this idea of how we could use messaging technology and conversations to, to, to make a more real experience for people and make it easier to use. And we took that into the personification of what we call Olivia. Um, and Olivia's an assistant, and her job as an assistant is to help get work done. So she helps the, the recruiters, she helps the hiring manager, and she even helps the candidate, all to facilitate that process of raising your hand or finding the right people for the job. Our clients are most overwhelmed at how simple the process really can be. And if we're able to free up their recruiters, their recruiting coordinators, whole talent acquisition team to spend more time with their candidates, free them up from the administrative work, they're excited about that. All right, that's great. So I want to thanks again to all of our sponsors and their support. And we had a great first session with Tim Sackant, and this is the rest of the agenda. We're right on time. That's the good news right now. And we are now going to move on to um, Kristen Magny, the VP of Talent and Culture at the Bazudo Group. And Kristen is going to talk about um, the Goldilocks effect, which I am fascinated by and excited to hear what this is all about and how that relates to candidate experience. So why don't we go ahead and get started with the next one. Here we go. And you're good. Hi everyone, great to be here today. We are going to be talking about designing an experience that's just right. And I've titled this Goldilocks Bears and the Candidate Experience. And, and we all know about the candidate experience. And you may be saying to yourself, well, what the hell does Goldilocks and some bears have to do with this? And I promise you, we're, we're going to talk about that too. So excited to be here with you. So well, what I'm hoping you take away from this discussion today is number one, why candidate experience matters. We're gonna do a little bit of design thinking and uh, talk about some candidate journey mapping, which if you've not ever participated in any sort of journey mapping, I think you're really gonna love the approach in thinking through your candidate experience. And of course, most importantly, finding balance in your experience and really what that has to do with is, is where technology fits in and as you're designing your candidate journey, what makes that uh, the right balance of technology versus human interaction. So a little bit about Pizzuto. I've been with Pizzuto for nine and a half years, but we are a 30 plus year old company. Our mission is we create sanctuary and we manage living experiences. We have a rather large property management company, development, real estate development and construction and home building. And so as you can imagine with a mission like We Create Sanctuary, it's really, really important that we are being welcoming and creating sanctuary for our candidates and also ultimately for our employees so that they can deliver on our mission of creating these experiences for the people who choose to partner with us and also the people that choose to live in our communities. So uh, the recruiters are tasked with not only finding people who have the skills and experience that we need, but also people that genuinely care and are very curious about others and are welcoming differences all the time and really showing empathy in their day-to-day -day work. So a big task at hand on, on some of the intangibles, but obviously as people are interacting with us in the post hire or pre hire process, this becomes a really important part of how we interact with candidates. Well, let's start with some of the challenges and, and then we'll move on to the opportunities. But this is really about the importance of candidate and ultimately what winds up being your employee experience. 
So this is a picture of my son who was 16 at the time. And he was really excited to find his first paying job. And it was a really interesting experience to see what his candidate journey is. And, and the reason I, I have the word empathy there, um, which is defined as the ability to feel someone else's pain, is that when we get into the discussion around design thinking, the key to design thinking is really having empathy, really understanding the pain that someone else is feeling in a particular situation. So you can redesign your process or redesign your solution with that end user in mind. So being that support person, being that person who was encouraging my son in finding his first paying job was really a lesson for me in, in design thinking and the lesson in empathy because his experience was less than optimal. He had situations where he was told he'd hear back from somebody, he went to an interview, he was told he would hear from somebody within a week, never heard from anybody. He applied to brands that we all know, brands that we would think that they've got the candidate journey down pat, and yet there were many missteps and, and mishaps from going to an interview, being offered a position and never hearing from someone again, um, to actually getting a job and then being terminated over text message because he wasn't able to work as many hours and uh, do some of the things that other employees who were older than him to do, and, and this was in, in food service. So, you know, a very rocky road, you know, that was unexpected for him, but a really good experience for me as a practitioner to step back from what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis and understand what those touch points were that could have made his experience much better than it actually was. And I also bring this up because I think that it's important for all of us as uh, companies and practitioners who are interested in the candidate experience and who are concerned in a very tight labor market with the whole issue of ghosting, that we've been as organizations as companies, we've been ghosting candidates for a really, really long time. And, you know, this young man, who I'm, I'm pretty passionate about his happiness, was a great example of someone who is being taught at a very, very young age that not showing up, not following up, not getting back, is okay, that it's common practice in business. And so it uh, is a great way to think about how, uh, how you change that, how you influence it. And on a, on a more enterprise level, really, what are some of the behaviors that we can change as organization or organizations and practitioners to ensure that we're not role modeling some of the behavior that we don't want to see from candidates or employees. So a couple of things to think about. An unsatisfied candidate is no longer a voiceless unknown who will complain about their experience to a couple of friends at dinner. In the 21st century, an unsatisfied candidate is an enraged Twitter account, an antagonistic Facebook page, and a hostile Instagram profile. Your company's reputation among customers is no longer distinct from your reputation as an employer. And I like to joke around that the monster, which is what I'll call myself, is probably worse than any of these things because it's very often that I'm telling people about what my son's experience, and unlike today, I, I don't keep the name of, of the brand silent. So, um, Every poor interaction that we have with a company, whether it be as a candidate or as a customer, is a possibility that you, you lose that individual's business and their network's business indefinitely.
So Virgin Media learned this lesson a while ago. Um, they actually did a rejected candidate survey and found out that um, a very high percentage of the candidates that they had rejected actually switched to competitors. And this, when they did the uh, analysis, cost them millions of dollars in business. And so it was a very difficult way to learn the, the hard cost of providing a poor hiring experience to candidates. So now let's talk about the opportunity, and this is coming right from our friends here at the Talent Board, but providing a great customer or a great candidate experience keeps customers loyal. So 50% of candidates who gave their experience the lowest rating said they would take their business elsewhere. It creates new customers. 70% of candidates who gave their experience the highest rating said that they would increase their buying relationship with the employer. It increases your talent pool, so candidates satisfied with their experience were more than twice as likely to recommend the employer to others. And last but not least, it helps you hire the best talent. So candidates satisfied with their experience were 38% more likely to accept the job. So now I'm going to move into this concept of design thinking, which I, meant, I mentioned a little bit earlier. And design thinking is a creative way to solve problems and it's, it's simple to form. And a lot of times you will find UX designers doing this as they're designing things that have some sort of technical interface. But the concept of design thinking can really be applied in a lot of different ways. And what we've done here at Bizzuto is we've applied a design thinking methodology to our candidate experience by doing some candidate experience journey mapping. So let's talk about the, the candidate journey. And, and this is not inclusive of every step that is going to happen in the candidate journey, but we all know that the candidate journey starts well before the person applies and well before they're hired. So the point of this funnel is to really communicate that uh, nurturing is a huge part of the candidate journey process. And particularly, we're facing some of the lowest unemployment rates we've ever seen in history. The labor market is extremely challenging in just about every industry. I know in our industry, in the apartment management and construction industry, there are far more jobs than there are qualified candidates to hire for them. So we're in a really challenging situation in terms of, of ensuring and almost being obsessed with the fact that um, our process is good and also that once somebody comes on board with with the company that their experience is not polarized from whatever experience they had as a candidate. So what we tell them, how we make them feel, the things that we do as part of our candidate journey have to be carried over the threshold and then also put into place as, as their employees as well. So think of the candidate journey as an appetizer, you know, Candidates are coming in um, as prospects, just like customers are coming in as prospects. The way they find out about your organization can happen in, in many different ways, but the reason I bring that up is because they're forming opinions about your organization based on what they're reading, based on what they're seeing, based on who they're talking to. And, um, that is going to be highly influenced by their networks. So uh, before they drop into the talent pool, where some of that more one-on-one -on -one nurturing can take place, you have to really pay attention to what is the message that you're delivering about how your organization is showing up and what it's like to work there. So they move through the funnel. 
Um, and it's really not until they get to that candidate nurture, candidate engagement stage that they're now starting to interact potentially with people who actually work at your company and then coming through the apply process. But I also have that little label in between apply and hire because we know that there are so many touch points in between when that application is submitted and when that person is actually hired. And understanding where the torch gets passed and where there are opportunities for that experience to be derailed is really important because for many of us in the talent acquisition space, a huge chunk of this can fall outside of our wheelhouse. And we have to make sure we've programmed about those potential, programmed around those potential derailers. So when we're thinking about the design thinking methodology and you know, before we get into our actual journey mapping, I like to point out what I call experience building blocks. Because there are a couple of pieces to that employee journey that you have to take into consideration. It's not just a, a tangible experience that someone has. So it's a collection of things that build on each other that are factored into the experience that you ultimately want people to have. And things can go wrong with any of these. So my experience building blocks, there's four of them. The first one is trust builders. And we all know that relationships are highly predicated on having trust. And so that is a real, really critical component to thinking about what are the things that happen as a candidate, um, moving them through that funnel, and even as an employee that build trust. So trust builders are actions taken by leaders that build trust and employee engagement. Then we have moments that matter. Moments that matter are, are hopefully very positive things that we want people to experience. Um, they're either anticipated experience or retrospective points in time that leave lasting impressions. So I'll go back to my son. When he was finally offered his first job that panned out and uh, on his first day, you know, those were all moments that mattered because that was a first, it's something that he'll probably never forget. Um, we've all had those moments, whether we've been promoted or we've found that dream job or, you know, we were recognized for something that we did. Those are all moments that matter and moments that we tend to not forget. Then we have processes. So these are series of steps or decisions that are intended to be followed in a particular sequence to navigate an issue or reach a goal. So you have a hiring process. Um, you have probably many processes that you follow, uh, whether you're trying to get someone hired or maybe to get promoted or to apply for a job. But when that process becomes too complicated, then um, that can be frustrating to a candidate. So it's really important to think about all of the processes that you're expecting somebody to move through. So application check, or application process, background check process, reference check process. What are all of those processes? Are they seamless? Are they integrated? Do things auto-populate? Are you collecting more information than you really need at, at the time of application? And so therefore you've now made that process frustrating for that candidate. And then of course tools. Tools is most often technology and we'll talk a little bit about the tech stack. But one thing I wanna point out about tools is that there's been so much of an inundation of technology within our world of recruiting that companies are feeling very pressured to automate everything, to provide a consumer grade experience. And we really have to get, uh, we have to be really careful with this because there's some things in my opinion that technology is really great for. And then there's other things that uh, technology really doesn't have a place for. And, and most of the time, technology is not gonna create moments that matter. And 
a lot of times technology isn't going to build trust either. So we have to think about where the right place in our candidate journey technology belongs. So now here's a, a little snapshot of some of the employee journey mapping that we've done. And what I have here is just a small piece from brand connection to first day. But you'll notice that what I've done is I've color coded those experience building blocks. So I know exactly as I'm thinking about the journey that I want Dave, our candidate to have, I know exactly what those building blocks are and how they come into play. So things like under brand, uh, brand connection, if they know somebody that works for your company, they've been a consumer of something that you sell, those are all trust builders. I trust this company's product. I trust the individuals that I know work at this company and therefore I'm more likely to apply there than I would be at a company whose brand I've never heard about. I don't know anybody that works there. I have no connections. Whereas things like your career site or job ads, social media, those are really tools that you're using. They have information. I wouldn't necessarily call them trust builders. Um, an example of a moment that matters, I'm going to skip to the first day here, is new hire orientation. So if you think about um, the last time you had a first day at work, the first day you moved into an apartment, the first day you moved into a new house, the first time you drove a car that you bought off the lot, those are all moments that matter and they need to be programmed accordingly. Most candidates or most new hires will decide in their first 30 to 90 days whether they are going to stay with the company beyond that 12 month period. So ensuring that the transition or the passing of the torch from being a candidate to being a, a first day new hire is extremely important. Another area that I think is important to, to point out in the candidate journey map is that pre-start time gap. I always say time fills all deals and it's, we're, we're in a market right now where people are employed. So you're looking at a minimum two week turnaround time between when you've extended an offer and when they are gonna come and work. And quite often these days, that might even be three or four weeks out, depending on the level of uh, individual that you're hiring. There's a lot that can happen in two, three, four weeks. And so when we talk about trust building in moments that matter, what is going on to keep that candidate warm? So if that offer gets extended, and then the new hire uh, does not hear from anyone from your company for, for two, three weeks, there is a huge opportunity for whatever relationship building has happened to be derailed. Um, and of course, in this job market, most candidates are not just talking to one, can to one company. They're getting offers. We're finding that we are competing against other companies who have offered the same candidates multiple job offers. So this has been our approach to, to the employee journey. Uh, we do this on a whiteboard with lots of post-it notes and we try to walk through everything that uh, in all of these categories that cover the very first touch point to the very last touch point as it relates to the talent acquisition function. And we've actually carried this employee journey mapping or candidate journey mapping into the employee journey map. So our journey map actually uh, extends over the entire life cycle of the individual's experience with our organization until potentially um, when they may exit from the company. So a couple of tips to take away 
Hiring is a collaborative effort. Uh, keep the lines of communication open and no part of that funnel is more important than another. So it's really important that everyone who is touching the hiring process, interacting with that candidate, is on the same page and held accountable for their role in the process. All right, the magic touch, delivering a just right experience. I told you I was gonna tell you why I got Goldilocks and the bears involved in this, and, and that's what we're gonna get into here. So the Goldilocks effect, You've probably heard the story Goldilocks, nice little girl, uh, wandered into a bear's house, slept on their beds, ate their porridge, and in the end, really couldn't find something that was just right for her. So the porridge was too hot, it was too cold, the beds were too hard, they were too soft. And so the Goldilocks effect can is really about finding balance. The, finding what's just right. And so that concept can, can really be applied to a lot of things. And recently I've been applying it to the candidate experience as we think about uh, technology and how technology and humans impact that just right feeling. So we've learned several lessons as, as we've toyed around with where we use technology, where our touch points are. Um, and I'll give you one example. Uh, we send an automated message out to a candidate as soon as they've been dispositioned as not qualified for a job. And we had to, our, our recruiting team is pretty good about moving through the incoming applications rather quickly. And we actually had to delay the deployment of that communication, we do, a, we do a candidate survey after the position has been closed or after that candidate has been dispositioned to ask them about their experience, so candidate experience survey. And in our candidate experience surveys, we started hearing candidates saying, well, you're using robots to, to view our resumes. You're not actually even, you know, a human isn't looking at our resumes. Well, we don't have any robots here that look at resumes. They are all humans. But we realized that because we were dispositioning people so quickly, that candidates started thinking that it was just automated, which it, it's not. And so we have made a conscious decision to delay that communication saying you've not been selected specifically so candidates wouldn't think they, that they were being dispositioned by an automated system. Um, so as it relates to the Goldilocks effects, you know, this is a, this is a great quote that I like from, from Jonah Berger. As customers, our emotional reactions are similar to the protagonists from the children's tale, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Whether it has to do with the softness of the bear's beds or the temperature of their porridge, Goldilocks is turned off by the extremes. So our candidates are turned off by, by the extremes as well. If something is too impersonal or too automated, it's a turn off. But if it's really lengthy and complicated, it's also a turn off. So again, going back to that balance, you have to really find, um, strike the right balance between where your technology is playing a role and, and where you put other components into, into your process. So I'm going to come back to the funnel again and say as you work through your design thinking and as you do your journey mapping to be thinking about where those handoffs are happening whether it's between a piece of technology and the candidate, whether it's between the candidate and the hiring manager, candidate recruiter, candidate technology, recruiter technology. I mean, these are all handoffs and these are all opportunities to either enhance the experience or derail the experience. And so here's where the bears come in. The bears are in the handoffs. So I've seen many times, I've seen it here where 
the candidate has built a wonderful relationship with a recruiter and they go out to a site to interview with the hiring manager and the hiring manager is late for the interview um, or doesn't show up for the interview or isn't prepared for the interview. And not to put it all on the hiring manager, we love our hiring managers, but that's just an example of a handoff where that candidate experience can be derailed. The candidate experience can also be derailed through technology. So um, depending on what you've automated or where you have those handoffs in your technology process, that's also another area if things just aren't working and it becomes too complicated for the candidate to get their information, get their story in front of you, they may become disengaged. These are my humans. Um, this is a, a piece of my team, but uh, one thing I really like to drive home is that um, robots will never take over recruiting because humans are the ones that create moments that matter. So we have very purposefully left technology to do the things that help make the recruiter more efficient, that really give them more what I call heads up time. So I don't want my recruiter spending their day toggling back and forth between a multitude of systems I want the technology to enable them to spend as much time as they can creating moments that matter and building trust with our candidates so that when it comes time to offer them a job, they feel really good about the decision that they're making. They feel a connection to our organization, to the people that are here. And I will tell you that we have an extremely high acceptance rate on our offers. And we're really proud of, of the work that our, our team does in building rapport and creating sanctuary for our candidates. So a couple of things in summary that I'd like you to take away is really consider applying the design thinking methodology to your candidate journey. I think it will really help to identify not only the experience that you want people to have, but it will give you the opportunity to step outside of your day to day, uh, think outside the box and um, pretend you're someone else, walk in a candidate's shoes. The touch points matter, so determine which ones you want people to remember and program around those. And then last but not least, watch out for those bears, they'll get you every time. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and uh, please let uh, please let the team know if you have any questions. Thank you. All right, that was awesome. Thank you, Kristen. And yes, beware of the bears. It's, you know, it's hard to do all the things that you're trying to do consistently in recruitment. There's so many things that are impacting your business on a regular basis, changes on the leadership team, recruiting team, economic fluctuations, mergers and acquisitions, the list goes on. And companies that really the hard part is doing this consistently over time. So I wanna thank Kristen again. If you've got questions for her, you can send them to support at the talentboard.org. And uh, again, that's what we want to do. If you've got questions for any of our speakers, send them to support at the talentboard.org. So now we've got another word, quick word from our sponsor. We're taking another break right now, folks. So hang tight. Thanks for joining us. All right, where are we at, Ron? What are we doing? What's next? Just so much good stuff to come yet. So, so much good stuff. Well, at the moment, we have a little break built in for everyone to uh, grab, those, to grab those refreshments and uh, take a little breather. And then we have uh, 
it looks like 1.30 Eastern time is when we were kicking off our next session with uh, the one and only Jerry Crispin and Shannon Pritchett. So the good news is that we are actually ahead of schedule for us by a few minutes. So why don't we everybody take a, a little break, check your email, get a beverage, eat some lunch, or whatever, wherever you're at, whatever time zone you're in. And we will be back in just a few minutes. I hope that you're enjoying the session so far. Ron, we're about, about a third of the way through. Is that right? Something like that. We got two Close. sessions down and, and five to go. Five to go. <laughs> but seven awesome sessions today. So I'm super excited for that. Yeah, no, again, chock full of recruiting vitamins and minerals, as I like to say, for everybody. So we definitely have got some great sessions ahead. Um, and one of our board members and co-founders of the Talent Board, Jerry Crispin, is coming up next with Shannon Pritchett. And so take a few minutes, folks, and we'll be back um, to start again at 1.30 Eastern. I wish I had some music for you all. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd play it. I could sing, but I don't think you want me to do that. So, Ron, do you want to sing? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass on that one, but um, I think everyone would love to hear you sing. So, Ron, well, we've got, I mean, we can take, we've got a couple of minutes while we're in this little break time, too, to talk. We've got some really, lots of exciting things going on, right? We've got multiple workshops that are now in place and planned with for candidate experience workshops that are hosted um, by a variety of companies, many candy winning companies and other companies doing some great things in recruitment. Starting next week in San Francisco. Can't believe it. Already next week. Yep, next Thursday. We're going to so hear from uh, What's that? Uh, Sequoia Equities, uh, one of our candy winners, is going to be talking during that too, which can be super Exactly. Super so these workshops, from. folks, if you've never been to one, they're all listed on our site at thetalentboard.org. I'll talk about them again at the end of the virtual conference. But it's a great opportunity to network with peers in your particular metropolitan area that you're in, wherever the workshop is, to hear from a company and the cool stuff they're doing in recruitment. Um, learn more about our benchmark research and the insights that we see on a regular basis, and then do discussion breakouts around a variety of topics, diversity inclusion, employer branding, recruitment marketing, and, and, and even technology impact on candidate experience, all lots of great discussion groups that we do in these workshops. And again, the first one, at least in North America, is coming up next Thursday, the 27th of February in San Francisco. And everything's on the site, talentboard.org. Um, we've also got, for those who are interested, right, Ron? We're, again, we're kind of rounding out this overlap of the 2019 year, finishing that up as we now as we're in the midst of 2020. So we've got our awards galas for me and APAC. That is right. I was giving you a little drum roll right there. <laughs> I figured that was. Thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. That's great. So that will happen um, on March 26th in Melbourne, Australia. We're going to do a APAC awards ceremony, and then on the 31st of March, we're going to do a. EMEA Candy Awards Ceremony in London. So we're excited about rounding out that year, plus our research reports, which North America has actually been available since before the holidays, but the EMEA and APAC are coming up very soon, and we're excited to get those out, and plus a little bit of a brief from Latin America, too, based on the data that we saw. Right, Ron? That is right. Super excited to uh, finally get those 2019 reports out there and then uh, fully move on to uh, this great 2020 year we got going. So Exactly. And then we'll be fit. We'll run the research through um, through August 31st and then we'll do, we'll analyze the data and start working on the reports and determine who wins the candy awards this year and everything will round out before the end of the year since we'll be on the calendar year going forward. So super excited about that. Um, what else? The workshops, this virtual conference, other events globally that we'll do. The program's open, as we already set, stated at the beginning of this virtual conference. You can participate now. No deadline to start, just a deadline to finish. 
and we help you through every step of the process and everything is available on our site. Very easy to review steps on what the process is like to participate in our benchmark research program. So if you've got any questions, of course, as well, reach out to us at support at the talentboard.org to ask um, besides any questions you have for any of the speakers that we have today. Ron, is it pretty cold where you're at right now? Kevin, Kevin loves to talk about weather when he's uh, I just on that long. I do, sure. It is, uh, feels like negative 10 outside. So <sighs> I am uh, nice, nice and bundled up and warm inside uh, here in uh, freezing Minneapolis, Minnesota. Don't you know? You, humans aren't meant to live in that kind of cold. Isn't that correct? That is correct. Yeah. That is uh, why we don't go outside much, uh, or at least I, I try to uh, limit that during uh, these fun months up here. Wow. Well, there you go. I, that's, um, and for any of you that are also in a, a cold part of the world right now, um, stay bundled up and inside and in this virtual conference right now, participating. We're, we got about, we're almost ready to launch the next session. So we appreciate everybody hanging out. Hope you had a nice little break. And what do you say, Ron? Should we should we hit it? I think it. I think it's just about that time. I think so. I think it's close enough. So let's. We're going to go ahead and get started with the next session, folks. Ron, why don't you go ahead and introduce our next session? Yeah, of course. So super excited for our next session. Thanks everyone for uh, sticking around and hanging in there with us. Uh, we are going to be hearing from Jerry Crispin, uh, Talent Board co-founder, which is so cool and then the principal and chief navigator at Career Crossroads, and uh, as well from uh, Shannon Pritchett, who's that managing director at Career Crossroads. And they're gonna be talking about the candidate, uh, the candidate perception gap around pay parity. So uh, super excited to, uh, to dive into this one. Yeah, this is gonna be a good one too. All right, everybody enjoy, and we'll see you at the end of the next session. Thank you. Okay, Shannon, so let's get started in all of this. This whole issue about gender parity equality um, has been something that's been on my mind for some time, but I have to say that the story for me was a meeting that we had um, in May when uh, we talked for about an hour about diversity primarily, but then there was a focus in on that gender parity issue and people, and one of the one of the top TA leaders in the room who also had responsibility for diversity, she, she basically started going, you know, we have to wait until the uh, heads of uh, the company, you know, get it, or we have to wait until the hiring manager gets it. And then she went, she went on and on for about oh, two minutes about all of the waiting. And then she just stopped and she said, I'm tired of waiting. And the entire room um, exploded and the rest of the conversation for the next, almost the next hour was about what we need to do, not waiting for other people, but why are we waiting? We should be stepping up. And that's kind of, that's kind of my lesson or learning from 2019. And now I'm seeing a lot of taking place, a lot of things taking place in 2020. But you've you've um, you've been dealing with this for a long time. Why why now? Why is gender parity for you um, a key issue and an important issue for you? Yeah, you know it's a great point, and it's uh, I echo that response. You know why wait? Um, it seems so bizarre. Um, you know I'm looking at the slide that you have right there, and it, it, we're expected to get there in 208 years. <laughs> You know, you know me, I'm a big fan of like the Botox, but I don't think I'm going to live 208 years. So, you know, that's kind of disheartening to know that I can work just as hard as anyone out there and not have equal pay. Um, you know, it's, it's a bias that many organizations have, you know, right. have come it's to hard, with. It's and hard to care for everyone in your organization when you know that there's disparity in terms of how people are being treated mm -hmm. on the basis of gender. And gender, I mean, half the world is female. And so arguably they're a majority. And if we can't find a way to get equality um, with that group, 
uh, how do we expect to get it with minorities um, and people who are disabled and race and age and all of the other isms uh, that are out there? So you'd think that that's probably where we could go first. Yeah, um, in my opinion, Jerry, pay would be the easiest way to set yes. an equal bar. But it's not the only one. And, and I, that's the other thing that I'm starting to see. And on this slide, you're looking at the gender equality index that Bloomberg has. There is more than one index around that. There's a global one, et cetera. But I happen to like this one because it's growing at a rapid pace. There's over 220 com or 230 companies last year who participated. And what they did is they gave to the database, if you will, and it was treated anonymously, but they gave the database a whole host of things that made sense from the point of what would gender equality look like if we had it. And, and among those things were things like um, cracking the glass ceiling, right? And among those 230 companies, there was a 40% increase in women going into executive level positions from 2014 to 2017. And they had, as a group of 230 companies, twice the representation of women on boards compared to other global companies. And so that, that kind of piqued my interest. And so these are the five areas that the Bloomberg Gender Equality Index looks at one of which obviously is equal pay, okay? So that's a, that is a, obviously a key issue. But there are other pieces like female leadership in the talent pipeline. So how many people at a high level? Inclusive culture in terms of benefits, uh, sexual harassment and pro-women brand. Those are all different kinds of ways of looking at that from the social side and beyond. You, you were particularly interested in the issues around an inclusive culture that that, that obviously benefits not just men, but also women. And there is a couple key issues that I think when we looked at that, that you, you valued or would value as a woman. Do you remember some of that in, from a conversation we had? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I was particularly interested in um, uh, fertility and infertility. Um, you know, you don't see a lot of that uh, on here. Um, and I think that is something that needs to be taken in consideration. Um, I've gone through infertility uh, myself, and um, I kind of did a, my own research uh, to see what are the companies that actually help employees with infertility challenges. Jerry, it's very, very expensive. I mean, you're talking about treatments that can go in excess of $100,000. Mm. Um, and there was only about a handful of companies that I can that I came across that are willing to help out employees uh, with this. Um, and it doesn't just have to be women, right? There are, are um, you know, uh, couples that, uh, you know, are, are male that go through the same problem. Yep. But, you know, there's only a handful of companies that, and they would maybe cover five or less percent of the cost. And excluded with that also, the lack of companies that don't give leave for or a limited amount of leave for um, paternity and frater uh, fraternity leave. Um, and so I thought that was uh, very, very interesting as well. Um, I, I think that needs to be taken care of. It's a key issue, and I think key issue for candidate experience because it's reflective that, you know, if I get into this company, is the experience that I expect to have there uh, going to be one that's going to be fair and that's going to uh, focus in on equality. We looked at, um, I think, one of the other mention, uh, things that uh, we mentioned earlier when we were looking at this was that the average number of weeks of um, benefit for a new parent uh, for those 230 companies was in excess of 12 weeks paid. And yet in our country, um, we're probably among the very last of the developed countries in terms of um, what benefits you have if you have ch children. Uh, and most of those are unpaid in terms of those benefits that are guaranteed. Yeah. 
And as I become a new mom, Jerry, talk about experience, I'm always amazed at the, the lengths families go through, because I'm learning this now, to make sure that they have the right employer for their family. Um, you know, I have friends who pick out their employers based on the daycare proximity. I have friends who are loyal to their employers simply because they have on-site or provided for daycare. Um, you know, I've never heard of a company providing daycare for um, interview, uh, parents who are interviewing. Um, are women returning to work after, uh, after leave? Um, I think we've seen those commercials on TV. Um, but I think if you look at Canada experience and you tie it into these things, that you can go beyond just the, okay, well, what if I have a three or four year old? What about the families who are, are, are people who are trying to get a family? Cool. I, and I do think that we're going we're gonna to focus on one specific aspect of candidate experience in terms of the kind of questions that we ask. But before we get to that, I just uh, kind of want to finish with the Bloomberg index that that this is not a small issue. I think that more and more companies will begin participating in these kind of indices in which they are acknowledged as being better than other firms, more competitive than other firms, not because they spend more money on ads in a appropriate magazine, but because they actually meet the, uh, the, the criterion that are developed in some of these indices. And in the case of the Bloomberg index, there's 230 companies who have $9 trillion in capitalization and, and employ 15 million people. So you know that this is moving in an interesting way. And the question I would have to all of the listeners is, where do you fit in this framework? If you're participating, how do you stack up? And how are you marketing that from an employment brand point of view? Because it's reflective of who you are. Um, not just in terms of the candidate experience, but now the employee experience, and that's a key issue. So there's a lot of progress towards parity from the promotions that we talked about to the uh, driving accountability, you know, in terms of uh, inclusive goals and what's going on in the, in the recruiting process. Um, but I, and the best of class benefits. Um, but we should be thinking about what people are doing. And calculating that gender pay gap is becomes a key issue. We've done a, our own research on that at Career Crossroads, and it actually reflects almost exactly previous research that we've seen that 20, only 27% of the Fortune 500 have even done a calculation about the gender pay gap in their company. And part of it is a fear that if they do it, then they have to do something about it, which is true. And if they don't do something about it, then that, that information is uh, discoverable. And it ought to be. But we should be doing that calculation. 100% of the companies out there should be doing a calculation. And then working on how they, how they handle that and how long it's going to take them to get to some kind of level of equality. Yeah. And that's something that's that's going to be key out there. So it's kind of simple. Data speaks for itself. You don't know if you're doing the right thing until the data tells you you are. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the Kennedy Experience Awards obviously is based on a set of surveys. And one of the questions, question 35 in the candidate survey, um, is how did you handle the salary question? How was that handled? And what's fascinating to me is that a third um, were asked about salary expectations, which is the highest number. And that obviously comes from the last few years where we become very sensitive to that. There's a dozen, um, a dozen states that actually require by law not asking uh, a candidate salaries directly. Um, so that's so this workaround of asking about salary expectations certainly has caught on and it's up to about a third The subject never came up 31% which may be part of that too It may simply be companies being let's not even bother talking about that um, all the way down to I Wasn't asked but offered it anyway um, I was not told the salary of the position after requesting it now start thinking about that from a candidate experience point of view. If I'm asking for information and the company is less transparent, 
and less transparent to the point of saying, I'm not going to tell you what it is um, and not explaining any rationale for that. Um, I would be curious as to whether that's going to impact the overall perception of candidate experience. And with the help of the talent board, with Ron and Kevin helping us out, we not only saw what the distribution of the total responses of more than 23,000 candidates who went through interviews was, but we, we were able to look at what the net promoter score, if you will, or what the index was for each of that, of that group. And that's, to me, really interesting. So if you were told the salary of the position without requesting it, the NPS scores were in the 60s, not only overall, but for the interview part. I find that extraordinary because that, and, and we're not going to go into NPS scores here, but the fact of the matter is there, it's a matter of intensity around the attitudes that are developing and about 80% or more of the people who were making these responses did not get hired. So I find that extraordinary. And then if you go to the other side, I was not told the salary of the position after requesting it, it's negative numbers. That means there's more people going out of their way to dissuade others to, to apply to your company um, than, than encouraging them. And this is logical. And I got to tell you, this question, while it isn't causative, is indicative of the kinds of other practices that companies are probably also invested in that are not helping the candidate feel like they're being treated fairly and helping them actually to conclude that they're not being treated fairly. The only other thing that I wanted to um, make a point of for this particular uh, webinar was we also wanted to see whether or not women would respond to this differently than the overall, than men. And um, so we looked at female candidates as well, just female candidates and how they responded to, or their NPS in terms of how they responded to each question. And it's pretty much, if you take a look at it closely, it's pretty much very similar. I don't know about you, but for me, what it suggests is that we have, we have a message that we're sending when we ask people what the salary of the position is based upon what we've been, what we know about how people are differentially treated in terms of salary and offers. And this issue about salary expectations is much more of a workaround than something that actually increases candidate experience. The differences, I think, are not strong enough to be that statistically uh, significant. But, but if companies become more transparent and more willing to share upfront and openly what the expectation might be about salary, rather than asking their expectations first, um, they're going to see a difference in how candidates respond to that in a positive manner. Yeah, I think, I think it's that's the lesson I get. Yeah, well, look, I noticed what's also low is I was asked my current and most recent salary was the lowest on both too. Yeah. That kind of tells me that, you know, when you ask how much the candidate is making, that sets off a awkward and probably tone that is not a good experience for the candidate. Yep. But when you come out front and you say, hey, this position pays 85000 that's a good experience. And I think this is good data to know because I think a lot of recruiters and hiring managers and get nervous and they wait for HR to have that conversation and et cetera. But when you kind of come out and set that bar right where it needs to be, regardless of who's in the interview, obviously that's going to leave a better candidate experience. Than I think the argument tends to be internally too, that um, if I, if I tell people salary, you know, what is the level of negotiation in there? And I, I think there's ways to accomplish that. You could say that, sure. you know, our philosophy about recruiting is, is that for most of the positions that we have, the negotiation is minor. 
Um, and it's usually within the first quartile of the band that people are coming into. And so 80% of the people that we hire uh, for this job will probably be offered a job between this small percent, this small dollar amount and this small dollar amount. So 80 to 85,000 or something to that effect. Would well, yeah, be no one wants to companies. waste their time. Yeah, yeah, no one wants to waste their time. You know, if you're making 90 and you're giving out the 80, 85 range, you know, then that's, that's going to obviously upset the person. That's why I think it's best to get it out of the way. If your state permits it, let them know how much it pays before you waste everyone's time in the process. So in summary, summary, when we start thinking about um, gender equality, there's a whole host of things that companies can and probably should do that impact the employer brand. But there's one thing that recruiting should be doing right now to step up, and that is rethinking how do we respond to the salary question, especially if, if the candidate is asking about it. Um, but in addition to that, there's such a, a, an enormous potential for opening up and providing that information in advance that would provide those candidates with a positive focus, positive experience for that part of it. And hopefully it, it stimulates other things that a, can, a company can do, not just within salary, but in other ways that they could be able to be more transparent. And so on that basis, um, anything else you'd like to add in summary there? Yeah, I, again, I think it's just uh, to recap to what you just said, and also don't be afraid to take that risk and, and calculate the uh, gender parity within your organization, because you don't know until you calculate. And, um, you know, once I think calculating it and determining that data is the first step in the right direction. Yeah, if you don't do that, you're going to find that both men and women, when they come in, will be asking, what is that gender parity? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, where are you publishing that? In other countries, it is required. So it should be a lesson to all of us. And on that note, thank you, and we'll move on. All right. Thank you, Jerry and Shannon. That was fantastic. If you've got questions for Jerry and Shannon about their gender salary gap, gender parity conversation that they just had, please send them to, to support at the talentboard.org. Ron, what did you think of that? That was pretty um, educational, don't you think? That was, that was. Always, always love hearing from Jerry and uh, it was great just to hear uh, Shannon's point of view, of course. Well, I, and I, because I have two daughters that are eventually will be in the workforce and the workplace. I really appreciated the conversation as well. And again, it was great that we were able to provide some of that data that you will also get back as an organization if you participate in the Benchmark Research Program. See how I did that? How I connected those? That's good stuff. There you go. All right. So um, we have another quick word from our sponsor, a little break time. Here we go. So we just finished with the candidate perception gap around pay parity, which was what I was trying to say earlier. And so what do we got now? Time, we've got a, like a few minutes before our next presentation, which is gonna start at 1.55 p.m. Eastern time, 10.55 a.m. Pacific time, or whatever time zone that you're in. We've got a few minutes before we get started with Adela Skolderman. So Ron, what were we gonna, talk about really quick in this break well we're just keeping on the event theme um and obviously we love our our big event in the fall every year so 
figured we'd give a little plug to our 2020 North America Candy Symposium and Awards Gala that we got a lot of stuff in the works for. I know that you're super excited for it. And uh, as, are as, as are you. As as am I. As, as, am as, I. As, as should everybody be out there. So it's gonna, we're going to have a save the date and some of the speaker announcements coming soon and in March. And this event is actually not in March. It's in October, October 26th in San Antonio in conjunction with the Erie Expo. Uh, and, and, and we're excited about that because we do a joint, the joint reception with the ERE, which is a lot of fun. And, um, but it's going to have more of a, the tech impact on recruiting and candidate experience, the good, the bad, the ethics, the all in between that we really want to uh, talk about this year, throughout the year for that matter, but as well as, especially in this fall, technology is pervasive. It is, it definitely empowers a lot of recruiting now. And even though candidates don't care about the technology stack that your companies have, at the end of the day, they don't unless they're in the space. What they care about is they care about you being engaged, communicated with, definitive closure, expectation setting. I mean, all the things that we've already been talking about throughout this conversation, starting with Tim. And so, but, and technology empowers a lot of that today, right? You, most of your applicant candidates, and we call everybody candidates for that matter at Talent Board, they are going to research your business and your brand. They're going to apply. And that's as far as they go. Right, Ron? That's as far as they go. That is it. And so and just... Go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but even for internal candidates, right? That is also, again, even though they may supposedly have a, a leg up because they're already working for the organization, it's still most even internal candidates are still only going to be exposed to that opportunity and maybe throw their hat in the ring, but not necessarily get it most. And so at that experience all across the board, it will again, will impact your business and your brand. Boom. So October 26th, San Antonio, North American Candy Symposium and Awards Gala, um, save the dates. We'll start going out in March. So I think we're ready, Ron, for Let's the next do it. Session. session number four. Session four, everybody. Thanks for keep hanging in there with us. Um, this session is titled Tapping into the Professional Gig Economy. So another take on another part of um, the workforce that we talk a lot about. But, you know, again, the candidate experience can impact them just as well as your full-time or, or part-time perm employees as well. So Adela Skolderman is actually a... a Candy experience consultant with us at Talent Board and helps us on our advisory services and candidate experience audit side. And she's also a talent acquisition manager at Expert Velocity. So we're going to go ahead and turn this session on for you. Everybody enjoy. Thank you so much, Kevin and Ron, for letting me participate today. And some of you might have seen my name with the candies. I am a candidate experience consultant. I'm also a talent acquisition manager. I work for a management consulting firm. For the past two years in talent acquisition within management consulting, I've been focused on the professional gig economy. I wanted to chat about this topic with you today because it's, it's a big one. And um, at the same time, there are many folks in the professional gig economy and contractors who really wanna get the word out to us in talent acquisition and um, and recruiting on how we can all work together better. So that's why I crafted my, my presentation around this topic today. Let's dive in. Today, I wanna to start by sharing a story. It's a true story about someone who I'm gonna call Mary. Mary was in an operations and customer support role in a really well-known retail organization here in the Northwest. For about three years, she worked for the company. She loved her job and she loved her company, but she wanted to make a career change. She wanted to be a project manager. There were three things preventing this change within the organization. One is that the organization's career ladder didn't allow for an easy shift laterally. Another is that she actually wasn't qualified for what would be considered a lateral position. 
And lastly, they knew that they weren't going to have headcount to hire a new project manager in the space for at least another year. Mary decided to do something pretty radical. After negotiating with people in the organization and getting the blessing of her manager, she actually resigned from her full-time position, sacrificing her tenure, her benefits, and her security as an employee in order to take a contract position within the same company. She did this to get that PM work experience that she's been after. Let me pause there because 10 years ago, in my experience as a recruiter, I can tell you this was unheard of. This might even be considered career suicide by some. I feel like as recruiters and hiring managers, some of us might have been, gosh, this is really risky. I don't know if we can consider her. But in today's market, this isn't shocking. It's, it's gutsy, but it's an admirable and innovative way to take one's career into her own hands. Again, for the past two years, I've been focused on this professional gig economy. I hire project leaders, change managers, and other consultants on contract. I want to take a note to say we're not going to talk about employment law today or AB5. It's important to acknowledge it, however. The truth is that it's still a nebulous and, and rapidly developing law, and I don't fully understand it. The best advice I can give regarding AB5 and illegal issues is let's stay very close to that council as we move forward and understand it better together. But today, we're going to talk about gaps. The gaps in how we historically engage with contractors and how we need to start engaging with them in order to retain the best and the brightest talent. Why? Because the war for talent is happening here too. Now, this candidate journey slide is a recap slide. I think most of us have seen some version of this before. Besides a couple of nuances, contractors really go through the same process. When it gets to the time for offer, we're talking about rate negotiations instead of salary. When it, when it gets time to hire someone, we're, we're not hiring contractors, we're, we're signing the contract. But essentially, they go through the same stages. And I'm gonna use this framework to talk about some of those perception gaps. Along with Mary's story, I wanna follow that up by giving you a hypo hypothetical example. And this is very similar to what I see on a daily basis. Let's say we have a company together. Our company is undergoing a big technical change and we need some contractors to project manage the implementation and the rollout of this software to our current employees. This role is expected to last about one year. Where do we start? How do we find these people? We used to think contractors were job hoppers. These were people who had some okay skills, but they were unable to make a commitment, or there must be some reason that they're not hireable. So we need to avoid them too, right? Well, that's what I thought about 10 years ago. And I, I wanna be clear, don't get me wrong, those people haven't gone away. But what I wanna to mention today is that there is a big difference as the, the, gig, the professional gig economy grows. There is, there's talent out there that we can't ignore and talent out there that we, we have to tap into. When you're looking at resumes, the first thing that I would do is take a look at duration. Going back to my example, I know this PM project is expected to last about 12 months. As I'm resume screening, I'm not gonna be so concerned with someone who's made a move every year. That's what I'm looking for. But if there's a project manager who's moved jobs every three to four months, and there's some big gaps in there, those are the folks that I'm gonna be concerned with. I would need to investigate, why did they leave every company so soon? Did the work end? Were they asked to leave early? Were the projects canceled? But what I really wanna point out is the good people who look just like our employees and who align to the same values are choosing a different employment model. Look at it this way. They have professional wanderlust. They're not job hoppers. They're driven by interesting projects rather than longevity. They're focused on delivery instead of climbing a corporate career ladder. Companies need to be agile, and this group of people can fix our problems fast. I wanna share some statistics with you. There is a growing trend of tech employers opting to bring on contractors rather than hiring full-time employees. An NPR poll in 2018 stated that freelancers and contractors made up about 20% of the entire labor market. 
today, that's estimated to be about one third of the labor market. And that number of freelancers and contractors is expected to climb to whopping 43% of the labor market by next year. These numbers say it's not just a passing trend. We all have to pay attention to what's happening here. Going back to my example, let's say for that project manager, we've posted a job advertisement. And we've, maybe we've engaged with a couple of staffing agencies to help us search. We're starting to see this huge fluctuation in rate ranges. Some of the PMs out there are $50 and some of them are $100 an hour. What's driving that? Well, first we have to understand the market rate for these roles. And I do wanna come back to talking about the market rate. What I wanna say here is within that, that market rate range, we truly do get what we pay for. If our need were to be focused on smaller budget projects, and we, were, we just needed people to look at, to, to schedule meetings, to document project progress, to communicate status, a $50 PM could suit our needs just fine. However, in this case, our implementation is a critical business change and is part of our strategy for 2020. We need someone who understands the impact of technical changes on, an, on, an, on a workforce and who can communicate with C-level leaders across the business. Basically, we need a leader, not a doer, and that person would be close to the $100 an hour side that we're seeing. We used to think that the gig economy and contractors were used to save money. The cost savings came from lower cost people versus hiring people for full time. And then we thought these lower cost people don't have the same quality of folks I'd hire full time. But the truth is the cost savings doesn't come from hiring contractors at a lower rate. Imagine if you had high quality talent for our need right at this moment and we're only paying for the deliverables that we need. At that point, we have the option to part ways with our workers, or if they're great, move them to a new, another project. Their rate on an hourly basis might be higher than, it's, than expected, but it's for a finite period of time. Also, we're not responsible for the benefits and the total compensation, just that hourly rate. Therefore, Cost savings comes, comes from hiring the right person to fix the problem or implement the solution and do it quickly. And the fact that our budget is going specifically to this solution without the added cost of a full-time headcount. To the worker, the end result isn't necessarily getting hired, maybe, but really what it comes from is a successfully completed project on time, in budget, and they've created a happy team and now they have a lasting relationship with you that could turn into more business for them and their independent business. Okay, back to our story. We found a few project manager candidates for our contract need and we're ready to interview them. The first thing that we're going to do is have them sign an NDA form. This way we can talk about our project confidentially and freely and share the whole context and our need with them. I was able to move my hiring manager past the stigma of job hopping but now she's starting to rule out some of my best candidates because they don't have seven to 10 years of experience in our industry. Here's how I'm gonna counsel her. Author Malcolm Gladwell famously said that a person must work 10,000 hours in a field to become an expert. The people in the gig economy might not be experts in our industry, but I'll tell you what, they're experts at change. Whether that change is a merger, implementation, a turnaround, or employee communications, one thing is certain, change in every industry is happening every single day. Maybe you might bring on someone on board who's gonna need a couple of weeks to ramp up on lexicon and acronyms, but that's an acceptable learning curve. What you'll get is diversity of experience and perspective. If you need a PM for healthcare implementation, and you're ruling out folks who don't have that 10 years of experience in healthcare, you just might be missing out on a candidate with the, liest, the, the highest likelihood of success overall. In our scenario, for our company culture, what we need is not just someone who can manage change and technology, but someone who's motivated by making teams happy, not by rates. Someone who likes to roll up their sleeves, doesn't lead with ego. 
Also, if this project happens to start going south, we need the PM who's going to dive in right after it and carry the team, not the person who's going to hold up their hands and say, I did my part, but it wasn't me. Now, we've interviewed those candidates and have some really good news. We've identified a finalist and we're ready to start negotiating the contract. So let's get back to that market rate. What do we pay him? We used to think, well, our full-time project managers within the organization make $100,000 a year annually. Let's divide 100,000 by 2,000 hours. $50 an hour is our answer, right? And the answer is no, and I'll tell you why. In this business, we have a rule of thirds. A full-time employee sees about two-thirds of their total compensation in salary, but there's that last third in the form of all the benefits that you offer your employees and that this contractor is not going to get. Contractors and independents often take a part or all of that benefit cost on themselves, not just benefits, but holiday pay, vacation pay, retirement, training, etc. They're only paid for hours worked, so expect them to be about 30% more expensive per hour. I would counter that we need to offer our project manager closer to $65 an hour. And that, in fact, will equate with our internal PMs at $100,000 a year. There are a lot of factors to consider when talking about rates. It really comes down to what's market. Everything has to align. How do you figure out what market rate is? And it's not easy at first. One thing I do wanna say is use your network of talent acquisition and HR folks, reach out to me. If you have questions, I'm always happy to help. But it is a lot of research and conversations until you get used to it. But it comes down to what economy, what is the economy like? What geography are you in? How big is your company? How technical is the work? The more technical, the more expensive someone's gonna be. Do you need a builder or a fixer? Or are you just looking for a doer? That matters too. What size of company? do you have? And lastly, how are you procuring this worker? Are you going direct? In my scenario, we're going direct here, but if you're using a staffing agency, you're going to have a cost on top of that. Um, their overhead, which is their, usually their finder's fee and search fee, essentially their commission. And then of course you have the option to engage management consulting firms where you are paying a premium, but what, what you're getting is a larger body of knowledge, a really strong reputation, and proven experts. Going back to our project manager, we presented the contracts to him and we verbally agreed we're going to start. The first order of business is make sure that contract was a solid one. What I mean is we have a contract that has been approved by legal and we've talked about the, the start and end dates, hours per week, rate, expected outcomes and deliverables, as well as things like how much overtime is, is allowable on this project, if any, because somebody has to pay overtime, especially if it's a W-2 person. Also, how about reimbursable expenses? How much time is, is needed on site in person versus can this person work remote? All of those things need to be discussed up front. Also, I like to remind people of the sensitive nature of the project work and while we can't have someone out there with a big black hole on their resume or LinkedIn, a lot of times we don't want people divulging our confidential details of our projects uh, on their resumes. So we, we can come up with acceptable language that we can give them that they can use to show they did great work. Another thing that's important, and this is not just for the benefit of the contractor, but this is for the benefit of the whole team and the project. What is day one gonna look like? Where will they sit? Who are the key players? And how can that contractor gain trust with the entire team and the stakeholders and build those relationships moving forward? Any of that feedback will make things move much, much better and make that project much more successful. Now, it's getting closer to the start dates. My hiring manager comes up to me and she asks me, Am I allowed to take this project manager or, or new person or contractor out to lunch like I would for a normal person on my team? 
And I tell her, absolutely. We have this fear of treating contractors too much like employees and then getting sued for it. It's sort of similar to on the full-time side when we have a fear of, of giving rejected candidates feedback and then getting sued. But the truth is, no one is gonna sue us for treating someone well and treating them how they wanna be treated. As long as everyone has done their homework and legal requirements are in place, it, the data shows that it is an unfounded fear. Just because they're a contractor, the way you engage with people on the job doesn't change. Get to know them personally and professionally. Provide them what they need to do their job effectively because they're not expendable resources. We're putting a lot of budget into them. Look at it this way. If you're listening to this webinar and you're engaged with the talent board already, you're concerned with candidate experience and engagement. So if we're spending a large budget on employee culture and engagement for employees, but then we're distinctly treating contractors differently, and we already heard that up to 40% of our workforce might be contractors in a couple of years, that's a lot of disengaged people, and it's going to take a toll on the entire team. That drag can be costly when we start to see low morale, employee turnover, and our projects not getting completed on time or on budget. In conclusion, I wanna circle back to Mary. Mary is the person who left her full-time job in operations to take a, a contract in the same company as a project manager. And true story, I work with her closely. Mary is going after the career she wants. And she now has this in-demand skill set as a project manager. Her project is part of the key global technology initiative for a retail organization that is rethinking itself. In today's world, the way that retail is going, that's a skill set she can take anywhere. We don't know what's going to happen next if she's going to be rehired as a full-time person at this company in project management, or if she's going to go and branch out on her own and, and be an independent consulting going forward. And I'm certainly not suggesting that we need to fire all of our employees who want career changes and give them contracts. But it's clear that this is a new active workforce who is very comfortable dictating new terms of engagement in exchange for the valuable skills that they can give us and that we need. From a decade of conducting the Talent Board Candidate Experience Benchmark Research Program, we frankly become experts at understanding the correlation between candidate experience and the business impact that it has. And as Kevin Grossman says himself, the data shows that a poor candidate experience will result in candidates taking their alliance, product purchases, and relationships elsewhere, resulting in significant losses for our businesses over time. We also know that a positive experience results in, in more engaged employees. The same is true here in the professional gig economy. When gig workers end a contract, we want them to tell their network, yes, I would absolutely work with that company again. They may not be employees now, but they, they might in the future. And they're probably customers, future potential clients or vendors, and they know a heck of a lot about, about our business now. Tribal knowledge that it just doesn't make sense for us to lose. If we engage them right, they can even help us to retool and retrain our employees to take our businesses to the next level. But thank you so much for joining me today. I would love to hear from you with any questions that you have or for further discussion as our workplace continues to shift. I'll hand it back over to Kevin and Ron, but you can reach me here at my email address. And thank you. All right, thank you, Adela, so much. And so sorry, everybody, about the, the sound coming in and out. Um, we did our best to improve on that, and um, the other sessions definitely uh, should go better based on what we've just triaged going forward. But if you have questions for Adela, please send them to support at the talentboard.org. You know, what's interesting is that many of your organizations, I'm sure you have a, a certain percentage of contract contingent workers. And for those of you who have kind of take that total talent approach as well, and to be able to see that there may be those who are on the contract side who could fit 
a perm role and vice versa, right? And have your talent be even more fluid, your people be more fluid to go back and forth, which again, why hence, you know, improving the way that they're all treated across the board can make a difference, um, especially when you're trying to fill those sought after roles and maybe a contractor can fill that role or vice versa. So let's see, where are we at, Ron? We, we've got another word from our sponsor. We're taking a break folks and be back in just a minute. We're gonna have some fun here today. We're gonna to talk all about innovation by design and how it relates to what you do. Today here we sit, several hundred people, talking about how do we advance this practice and how do we get better at what we do and how do we evolve what we do. Understanding that recruiting is changing and developing your skills to stay up and current with them in your teams and creating the experiences that the candidates now want. I mean, if you think about it collectively in the room, these companies represent hiring millions of people a year, right? So being able to learn from them, being able to interact and, and just kind of iterate on our own strategy is super helpful. And I think it's also just focused on community, right? These are real relationships that are forming that will last for, for years. The speakers all are experts in what they do. I mean, the sessions are really tailored to the information that people need in their jobs. The energy is so fun. Everyone really wants to be here. They brought people together that had like the same nerded out in like interests. Like we all want to come in and we all want to talk about this stuff, whether it's the technology, the content, any of the process, all of it. And so to me, that's why you show up here is that community gives you back more than you'll ever be able to give them. For me, it's the quintessential place to be. I like that it's, it's more intimate. I spend a fabulous amount of time connecting with people and it's really valuable for me to be here. All right, and see what what time is it, Ron? It's two, almost two twenty, Eastern. That is correct. That's what the old the old clock says. That is <laughs> the as opposed to the new clock. Yep, they might right? say something a little different. There's a new clock, and then no, 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 there's all kinds of clocks, and we um, so yes, that's where we're at right now. So we've got actually a short break. We got a few minutes, and I think Ron, you're going to talk uh, just for a couple of minutes while we take this break. Everybody, stretch your legs, get a get a beverage, use the restroom before we start the next session. Um, you're going to talk a little bit about our workshops again, right, Ron? I am. I thought this would be a fun time just to highlight some of the fun cities we're going to. Before we do that, I did want to make a quick joke about how um, we are officially over halfway through today. So thanks everyone for for sticking along and being here. Um, I did have a professor that would um, change his volume of speaking from like very loud to very soft in the middle of lectures and things like that to make sure that everyone was paying attention, uh, <laughs> everyone on their toes and everything like that. So you could, m maybe that was on purpose by the town board to make sure everyone uh, at home was uh, wide awake and, uh, and on it, but. Um, we, we should do <laughs> That's really funny, actually. And, 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 and what an idea. That would just, I think it would drive everybody bonkers, but that's, it is fascinating, right? You got to really pay attention to catch what's going on when you fluctuate the volume like that. Interesting. Hopefully we didn't drive everyone bonkers. <laughs> wow. Well, there you go. That's, that's a really good point. Let's, so what about the workshops? All right. So next, so as we said, uh, next Thursday is our first workshop uh, we got coming this year. Um, we're going to be heading to San Francisco. So super excited. Uh, as someone coming from the cold weather, I'm very excited to uh, defrost and come to San Francisco. Um, like we said, we're hearing from Sequoia Equities, uh, one of our Candy Award winners. Uh, and March 31st is the second workshop we have this year. That is in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, on March 31st, and that's hosted by Nthrive. And uh, we are super excited to be back in the Atlanta area for that workshop. Um, for everyone at home, uh, you can go to the townport.org and click on events, and you can see all of these lovely events that, uh, that we're reading out here. Um, we're excited to, we're heading to Los Angeles after that. So April 8th, we are in LA at 
Jet Propulsion Laboratory again with NASA. And, and a quick a quick note about that one for those for those space fans out there and all things space. That's a super fun one because we do it in their museum auditorium area. So we're all the the past space things, the Voyagers, the um, except for the Mars rover, that's actually not there. That was shipped out, I heard. Um, but we do hold the workshop in this in their museum auditorium. And I'm telling you, if you are a fan of of NASA and all things space, it's pretty fantastic. And even if you didn't know you were a fan, I'm pr I bet you are when you when you go there. <laughs> right. uh, I, I left a pretty huge fan of NASA. That was quite a, quite a, quite a, quite a museum. And uh, we tried to be a little nicer this year and, and not have it on the Friday uh, before Easter this time. So yeah, not this time. <laughs> nope. We are uh, we are heading there uh, April eighth to uh, back to JPL. So we're super excited to be uh, a, a multi candy award uh, winners hosting that one. So that's super cool. Um, Still got a little more time. Hopefully no one's annoyed with us yet. April 22nd, we're heading to Philly. Good old Philly Philly for uh, Comcast is hosting that one um, on April 22nd. Super cool. Uh, April 30th, we are heading to St. Louis. Um, and that one's going to be hosted by Enterprise, which is super awesome. And then we actually also have a uh, a speaker from Dent Wizard, who you are also going to be hearing from in our next session, which is yes. so, so Tony is going to be at the St. Louis workshop uh, April 30th, and he's going to be hanging with us and talking at the candy workshop as well. So just a quick little sneak peek of some of the cities. We got San Diego, Dallas, Lexington, New York, Toronto, and Salt Lake City all coming up after that. So. Absolutely. Lots, lots more to come. And those are, again, are, are, are super engaging and uh, all about talking shop, talking recruiting shop. And that's what we, we like to do. So I think we're ready, uh, Ron. So I, I think we're going to dive in. I think you're going to introduce Tony then, correct? That sounds great to me. So... Moving on to session five. Thanks, everyone. Um, so we're going to be hearing from Tony Sesda, Director of Talent Acquisition and Talent Strategy at Dent Wizard International, one of the Candy Award winners from last year. And he's got our cool little pin on his uh, jacket right there. And Kevin and I love to rock that pin. And he's going to be talking about how Dent, Dent Wizard won a Candy Award and why that doesn't matter. Ooh. So I'm super excited to hear from Tony. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks so much uh, for tuning in to my session here, uh, how Dent Wizard, Dent Wizard won a candidate experience award and why that doesn't matter. Uh, title is a little bit of a, a clickbait for you, uh, but it does make sense kind of at the end when I tie it in. Um, so again, you know, Candidate experience uh, needs to be from first click to first day and beyond. I, I know I got that somewhere else. That's not my saying, uh, but I kind of wanted to share that because you'll, as I go through kind of the perception gaps and as I talk about all the different things that really got Dent Wizard to where we, we are and, and uh, from where we were, you know, that'll make sense. That's something. It's really from first click to first day uh, is what we're talking about. So a little bit about me and then about the company. Um, I've been with my company, Dent Wizard, for about five years. Um, my academic background is in org management and industrial and organizational psychology. Um, that's kind of why I think I like to play in this area of candidate experience and systems and strategy. Uh, you know, I really have specialized in the last 15 years in, in workforce systems like applicant tracking, uh, HDM, CRMs, workforce analytics, assessment tools. There really probably isn't an ATS that I haven't touched in the last, uh, you know, 15 years, either for the companies I've worked for or just in partnering and kind of uh, working with organizations like the talent board. Uh, Dent Wizard overall is an automotive reconditioning company, so what we like to say is we make cars look pretty. Uh, that's what we do here. We have about 3,000 employees in the U.S. and Canada. We're mostly a mobile workforce, so over 90% of our, of our employees work in the field out of a, out of a truck, um, day in, day out, no matter the weather, rain, sleet shine, uh, you know, extreme heat, extreme cold, uh, they're out there, which, you know, provides a unique um, 
difficulty for us to find candidates and, you know, really give them a good experience uh, and that it's so much more important for us to give them a good experience uh, from the get-go. So um, our technology, as you can see on the list here, we are JobVite, ATS, CRM, and onboarding. Uh, we use Surveil. Uh, as many of you are, if you're experienced uh, with the Talent Board or the Candy Awards, uh, we use that to track our candidate and manager experience. Uh, we use the Canvas text platform, and then we use a, a company called NAS and Activate for our recruitment branding, uh, which are all things that I talk about. So, um, Dent Wizard, I want to talk about a little bit starting off where we were and where we needed to go. So, uh, Dent Wizard, before we really thought about candidate experience, we were recruiter systems and HR centric. So what that means to me and what that meant was that we really cared more about what the recruiter was doing and how our systems worked and was HR getting what they needed and, you know, were we collecting the information we wanted from the candidate. We asked for information, just tons of information on an application. And you know what? We didn't need most of it. <laughs> uh, you know, I hate to say it, but we were making people fill out applications. I've seen, the, you know, a meme floating out on LinkedIn or something recently, um, you know, about people talking about, you know, they submit their resume and then they're asked to fill out an application, you know, and, and sometimes I've seen applications, uh, um, you know, a company I was with before Dent Wizard, you know, we had something like 127 fields. Uh, that needed to be filled out. So if any of you have those long applications, you know, really think about the experience that that's providing. Um, you know, candidates needed to come to us. We didn't really, we kind of thought like, hey, you know, if, if they want a job, they're going to come here. They're going to come and talk to, to Dent Wizard and they're going to put in the time and the application and the resume and answer all the questions we want if they really want a job. It really lacked kind of this relationship mentality, and we we only kind of just tracked the resumes that came in. That was our measure of success. That was our metric. Um, so moving forward, where did we need to go? You know, we needed to really think about the candidate up close. Think about them personally. What was going to make them have a vested interest in coming to work at Dent Wizard? We wanted to really take a, a stance on saying we're going to listen to what they're saying and we're going to react to what a candidate is saying. We're going to make the process easy. Remember, I go back to those applications that we were talking about. You know, 120-something field application can be shrunk down to, you know, 30, 40 fields. I know I did it, <laughs> and, it and it worked. Um, you know, we're going to pursue candidates where they're comfortable and how they're comfortable. You know, we're going to talk to them through text. We're going to talk to them, um, you know, uh, after five o'clock, just all these different things to stop this idea and this mentality that, you know, we needed the candidate to adhere to, to us as a company. We Instead, we were going to go and try to make the candidate comfortable and thus have a good experience. So I get into a couple gaps here. Uh, gap number one is brand awareness, uh, giving them the fluff. Uh, and so I talk about this because so many companies out there think that um, they know what the candidates need to see. They know, you know, from, from the very top of the company, you know, how many of you have organizations where your website or your social media is controlled, you know, way up high. And in our organization, you know, that's the case. It's controlled by our marketing group and our recruiting group uh, or the people that got together. And what we really understood was we were trying to shove information at people that they didn't need or they didn't care about, um, that we weren't connected to the pulse of what, you know, our candidates wanted to see. So one of the things, you know, we did was understand what's being said about us and understand what the value propositions that we are, or I'm sorry, that we have that we can give people about, you know, their job uh, and, you know, what we can provide their family, what we can, um, you know, what we can give them that's above and beyond just, just work. Understanding behaviors uh, from those that are applying and doing those roles. We took time to learn 
and thus come up with, you know, EVPs, employee value propositions that were really important. Um, something else we learned was we need to stay away from impersonal and generic. That's something that I think is a really big gap um, and that can really fit into almost every slide I have, all the different gaps, is that all these different areas, we can talk about brand awareness, so we can talk about applications and interviewing. And as we talk about that, something that's a gap that's really important to hit on is, is impersonal and generic. We talk to candidates like they're all the same. We provide them information like they're all the same. I mean, it's funny because we only have several large job groups in Dent Wizard that, um, you know, that we hire for, meaning like paintless dent repair techs and paint, uh, auto paint body techs and automotive detailers. And you would think we can throw the same information at all of them, but you can't. And so you need to think about a really personal and a, a non-generic way of talking to them and a way of presenting things to them because that's what's going to give them this warm and fuzzy feeling inside and say, hey, I really want to come work for that company. So stay away from the fluff and really talk to them about, you know, what's important to them, what, what will drive um, the organization from those candidates. So secondly is applications. You heard me talk about, you know, more. Uh, we have applications, you know, people have applications out there with hundreds of fields that need to be filled out. More is not always better. If you don't need it, don't ask for it. A perfect example for me um, was education. Education can take up 30 something fields. You know, uh, do you care about where somebody went to high school? Do you care on what there, it's funny because there's often a field like it'll say high school, where you went, and then it'll say, you know, what was your uh, highest, you know, degree obtained, and then it'll say like, what was the major? And it's like, well, it was high school, it was a high school diploma. So, you know, taking out some of those fields, we took out, you know, the what high school you went to, what uh, this, your GPA, what degree you had, all the way through college, and we replaced it with what was important to us. What was your highest level of education? It's a drop down menu. One thing that somebody selects, we were able to get rid of 20 boxes that they needed to fill out. So I, I use that as an example because more, again, is not always better. If you don't care about it and you don't need it, delete it. Um, you know, greet every candidate with excitement. This was something that, again, I'm going to talk a little bit about interviewing uh, is the next gap, but this was a gap for us is that we went into it like the candidate should be excited to come to us, that we should feed off of their excitement. And it, it's the other way around. You know, we should be greeting this candidate, you know, whether it be on the phone or a first contact email saying, hey, I'm so excited to meet you. I'm so excited to get to know you. I really want to better understand what it is that drives you and why you want to come work for, for our organization. You set that positive tone, which is so important um, throughout the entire process. And it makes your life as a talent acquisition specialist or leader that much easier as a, as a hiring manager. If they're excited because you made them excited, it's, it's easier to set that tone. Otherwise, you know, you're feeding off of each other and you're trying to mirror, which is, you know, something that I don't know why they teach anymore, you know, mirror your, your interviewer. And there's just this blah tone through the whole process. And it feels more like work um, in the interviewing. You know, you want people to feel like they're coming into a place where they're going to have a, a great day doing what they love, not that they're coming to a job to make a paycheck. Um, being responsive throughout the process. You know, that, that goes without saying. Uh, candidates want to know where they stand. Um, don't just let them hang out there. No, this idea that, um, and I'll say this again later, that no news is good news. That's not, re that's not a real thing. That's not true. <laughs> so, um, you know, be responsive. Talk to them about, you know, what the next steps are. Uh, notify them in a timely manner about their status, where they're where they're landing. If they're not, if you're not interested, then tell them that. They will appreciate 
the honesty and appreciate the closure. You know, these, the application process, the interview process, it's all a relationship. So, you know, they want closure if you're, if you're breaking up with them. So give them that. Um, you know, interviewing, and I, I, this is, I love to tell managers this all the time. You're not doing them a favor. <laughs> so stop acting like you're doing them a favor. Somebody coming in to apply for your job or, you know, an interview is not doing your organization a favor. You're not, you know, giving them a, doing them a solid by, you know, coming into the interview and taking time out of your day. It's the other way around. That candidate is coming in and taking the time to, to, to spend with you or your recruiter. And, and in some cases they're taking PTO uh, to come in, especially for those passive candidates. So treat them like such, treat them like, you know, that, Hey, you're, you, you did a great thing by coming in and I'm very happy to meet you. And I'm very excited that you're here and stop this idea that you're so important that, um, you know, you don't have time for them. I'll tell you a know, real quick 10 second story is I had a manager once and this wasn't a dent wizard, but I had a manager once tell me that he needed candidates to see how busy he was and how important he was so they would know what to expect from him as a boss. So he took calls on his cell phone. He let people interrupt him at, at the store. And, you know, because he, he wanted to show this candidate how important he was. And he treated this interview, each and every interview, like he was doing the fav a favor to that candidate just by coming in and taking time out of his day for his interview. So, you know, it's really important to, to get beyond that and, and again, provide that excitement, as, as I said earlier. Um, provide real value propositions. Talk to them about, as I said before, collect, know what your the people doing the job and what the people looking for the job find value in and present that set the expectations, let them know when they can expect to hear from you, let them know what they um, can expect in the process, let them know who they're going to be meeting with. I've actually got a great slide and this is from uh, the talent board. Uh, they put this out. This is from the, the 2019 um, candidate experience benchmark research program, which drives the candies and it talks about all the different activities and the kind of the gaps where people are, are, are seeing and, and where people aren't getting what they need candidates, uh, excuse me, not just people, candidates. And, you know, I look at the very first one interview names and background information on the people they're going to be meeting with. I cannot believe that, that candidates would not be provided this information, but it happens. That is a huge miss in an organization and a huge miss in the candidate experience opportunity by not giving them that information. And the fact that, you know, that a, a really big chunk of people are saying they're not getting that is, is huge. Um, you know, a detailed agenda. I mean, and that, that doesn't take barely any time, you know, to fill out. Um, you know, it can be a standard something that you, a standard format or form that you have that you plug in a little bit of information and boom, it's out the door, it's in the candidate's hand, and they have that. Um, you know, escorting between interviews, I think that's really important. You know, it can go down this list one by one by one, but, you know, each and every tool or each every piece of this is a tool in your toolbox. It's a, a weapon in your arsenal, if you will, and you really need to take that time to give them a good experience. And this, this table is really laying out for you what, what's important. So I highly recommend taking a look at this. Uh, you know, it's out online. Um, there's a great article that goes with it. Um, so I highly recommend looking it up. But I wanted to include this just to show you and give you a visual on, you know, all the gaps in the interview process. So moving on, um, gap number four, again, feedback. Feedback isn't just for you. Um, this is probably maybe should have been gap number one. I, I guess I wanted to go in a chronological order, but this is probably one of the most important things that I think of. Um, again, I go back to you're not doing 
This isn't a favor you're doing for the candidate by giving them feedback. Um, rejections are tough. And, you know, sometimes they're, they're hard to hear for a candidate and sometimes they're hard to deliver as a uh, hiring manager or a recruiter or whoever it is in your organization that delivers feedback. But it's a necessity. Not everyone will agree with the feedback you're going to give, uh, but given the option between none and something, constructive feedback is always going to be well received. It's always going to give them that closure in that relationship and say, you know, hey, I heard something that I didn't want to hear about myself or that I didn't want to hear about the company, especially if you're doing a great job about making them excited. It can be an even bigger letdown that they didn't get the job. However, if you're telling them why, you know, you're giving them that closure, giving them that, that experience of understanding what it is that they didn't have what you know what it is that they can work on and i know a lot of people are really worried about lawsuits and are so worried that oh if i tell a candidate anything they're going to turn it around because you know they believe that everybody's litigious and you know and, and that's not true um you know i'm not saying that you have you can't you don't have to be careful and you you know but you know our organization we have a a form. We have a, a process around what feedback we're going to give a candidate. And, you know, it's personal and it's, it's tailored to each individual candidate, but we don't go overboard. We don't, you know, we don't go into the taboo areas. We talk about professionally what it was that we didn't see, what it was that we did see, and what it was just that made them you know, not get selected at this time. And you know what? It holds on to candidates for the future. So, you know, this gap of I'm not going to give feedback because I don't want to be held accountable if somebody doesn't like it or I think that, you know, no news is, is good news and so we're not going to, you know, I'm going to hold this stuff back. No, give them feedback. Give them feedback more than once. You know, if, you know, I, I encourage my recruiters, hey, give them feedback about your conversation right away and that even if you're going to submit them to the manager and move them along in the interview process it's good constructive feedback that they need to be successful so please provide that it, it is it, it is a game changer for your organization uh, and I, I you know i highly recommend it. It, it you know the last thing i'll say about it is take it personally the candidate is so you know, take it personally and, and give them that experience um, that they want. So on to the other good stuff here, which is, uh, you know, these are the metrics. The metrics will present the gaps. Um, you know, there was an article, like I said, where I got that information from the town board that said, mind the gaps. Well, if you want to mind, figure out what gaps you need to mind, look at your metrics. And, and these are my real metrics. I literally pulled them and put them in here yesterday. Um, so this is our net promoter score, our brand affinity, uh, the, the candidate satisfaction with recruiters, the overall candidate satisfaction. These are some actual comments that, um, that were left by candidates. Um, this is the top, whatever, seven, six, seven comments there. Um, so I wanted to share these because I've got nothing to hide. And, you know, a net promoter score, um, you know, of, of almost 59 is, is fantastic. You know, we have some dips and we have some lulls. We understand what needs to be, um, you know, that sometimes we need to address some things. And as you can see, you know, we, we went up um, over the last 30 days. So, you know, the, the metrics, I, however you capture them, whether it be, you know, using, we use Surveil, uh, like I said, um, or you have some sort of internal um, capture system, but really take the time to understand the candidate experience, put it on metrics, look at the data, understand the data, and understand the gaps, and then do something about it. Just, you know, don't just collect the data, just like I said with ap applications, don't just collect data for collecting data's sake do something with it. The smallest um, changes that you can make will make a big change in your organization and make a big change to some candidates. So, you know, if you can change some perceptions 
and your of your organization in you know a few small tweaks to your application process and your um, interview feedback and your manager's questions, things that take mere minutes sometimes to adjust um, can make big impacts on your candidate experience. So the big question, did we win and does it matter? Yes, we won a candidate experience award. Um, there, you know, some great pictures of, of me with the talent board there kind of accepting our, um, our award and there's our award on the on the right um does it matter does it matter that we won the award it matters to me to sh prove to the organization that hey you guys have done a good job um providing a good candidate experience that you listened to the changes we needed to make we augmented the system where it needed to be we applied the technology and put things in place that needed to be put in place to win but i'll tell you this it, we started our surveil journey and collecting data over two years ago, so two plus years ago, and we won last year. That was the, the first time we had, uh, um, you know, applied and or actually made it through the whole process. And it wasn't a surprise. We've won other awards for uh, recruitment innovation and things and things like that. And uh, I, I was I had the pleasure of talking with. Uh, you know, people from the talent board and Ron and Kevin and um, Jason uh, Moreau, who's the CEO of Surveil, and, and a lot of people from his team, and they were kind of saying, hey, you should apply for this award. You're already doing the work. You know, you could potentially win something. So, you know, I wrote an article that actually goes by the same, uh, the same title, uh, you know, how, why, uh, how did Dent Wizard win a candy award and why it doesn't matter? And it talks about that the same story about how we were already doing this and why that, you know, how that got us to winning an award. And, you know, while again, clickbait is the title a little bit, and I'm proud of the award we won, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that we only focused on candidate experience just to win award. And that's what I want companies to, to really think about. Whether you're out to win award or you're not out to win an award, focus on candidate experience. Focus on it, you know, 365 days a year, you know, every year and continue to grow your candidate experience. It's going to provide a better talent uh, strategy for your organization. It's going to provide a greater desired superior outcome uh, and it's going to make your team feel good and it's going to make and most importantly it's going to make the candidates feel good and they're going to feel good about your company so that's everything i have uh you know i really thank you for for taking the time to to listen to what i have to say um here's my contact information please feel free to reach out to me anytime uh you know send me a linkedin request i love networking i love talking about uh, candidate experience and talent strategy and systems. So please uh, don't hesitate to, to reach out to me. I'd love to connect. Thank you very much. All right, Tony, that was awesome. And again, yes, candidate experience 24 7, 365 days out of the year. Not only for your external candidates, but again, your current employees as well, because we're all having to constantly re recruit to retain. So that was a great presentation from Tony about the work that he's been doing at Dent Wizard International, don't you think, Ron? I do, I, I loved it. I love that uh, it, it's easy to get caught up in all the awards and accolades and things like that, but at the end of the day, it's about providing that great candidate experience. And about the work, yeah. Well, and again, and how it helps to, you know, improve the more of a positive impact on your business and your brand, considering that you're saying no to nine out of 10 people for any given job at any given time. So if you got questions for Tony, send them to us at support at the talentboard.org. We are down to our last hour. We've got two more presentations to come. So let's take a little break first and we've got another word from our one of our sponsors. Here we go. Even with all the buzzworthy tech out there, most talent acquisition leaders struggle to find and retain highly skilled talent. Constrained by siloed, piecemeal solutions, talent acquisition teams lack the tools and processes to confidently achieve consistent hiring results. 
It's time to transform your hiring from reactive to proactive with Jobvite, a comprehensive talent acquisition suite backed by an award-winning hiring methodology. With a marketing-inspired approach, Jobvite makes it easy to create branded, personalized candidate experiences that attract, engage, and hire talent, both inside and outside your organization. Streamline and accelerate your hiring processes through smart automation and deep integrations with third-party HR systems. And Jobvite empowers long-lasting improvements with better end-to-end -end candidate journey visibility. With the industry's best technology and services, Jobvite helps talent teams evolve to be a strategic service to drive business results. Recruit with purpose. Hire with confidence. Jobvite. All right. So now we are down to the last little bit. We've got uh, a couple of minutes before we start our next sixth session. We got two more sessions left. We've got a great one coming up that's going to talk about um, diversity and inclusion and um, ways to improve that view as it relates to recruiting and candidate experience. So excited about that. And then we've got one about relationship building that's going to round us out. So thanks for hanging in there, everybody. Uh, Ron, what do you think? What, what's been something that has been a takeaway for you so far today? Oh man, you're going to put me on the spot like of that. Course. Of course. There's a, uh, I feel like I could give a takeaway for, for each of the sessions we've, uh, we've heard so far. Um, I mean, I guess just, uh, just top of mind um, after Tony's presentation, just, um, <clears throat> just really looking at all those different gaps, I thought was, was, um, was really neat. Um, the, uh, obviously I love, love Tim's presentation and just uh, a funny, a funny, funny way of looking at it, but just, um, you know, just all those different um, reality versus expectation, I think is, is huge in terms of, uh, that experience and and uh and keeping it real right absolutely i mean i think yeah and i agree i think that's why i liked the the language in that one too just because of just keeping it really simple and real and and every day and i mean there's been a lot of valuable information that's been conveyed so far in this and we've got two more yet to go and again you know like i say it over and over again the heavy lifting in in keeping recruiting recruiting a more human, better experience overall it takes a lot of work. And then kudos to the teams. And whether you want a candy award or not, doesn't matter. For those that are working hard to really ensure that the perception of fairness overall is is higher, or you know, and above average for that matter, is is critical because that's going to impact whether or not candidates decide to do something with you going forward, including being a brand advocate. So. So there you go. Um, I think we are ready to go, Ron. So is this, it's my turn, yeah? It is, let's do this session six. All right, Stephanie Wimusa is going, she's the VP of Diversity and Inclusion at Talavista and also a communications trainer and adjunct professor at San Jose State University, which is my alma mater, go Spartans. Very happy to have her presenting and um, talking about the looking glass of diversity don't like what you see, here's how to improve your view. So here we go. Hello everyone. Thanks for taking the time to participate in our webinar. Our topic today is the looking glass of diversity. Don't like what you see, here's how to improve your view. The essence of our talk today are ways to improve diversity within our organizations through hiring practices in a sustainable way. Let's start with our agenda to give you a view of what we will be covering today in our webinar. An introduction of me, we will explore what I call the three Ps, people, process, and progress. The three steps to improving your view within your organization, moving you to progress in your diversity efforts. My name is Stephanie Waymusa, and I have about at least 20 years of experience in HR in multiple areas especially in the areas of diversity, inclusion, talent acquisition work, change management. Those are the areas I've, I've most spent my time in, in various industries from manufacturing to computer software. 
I have an undergrad in behavioral science and a master's degree in human resources, organizational development, and a few assessment certifications. I'm the VP of diversity and inclusion for Tal Vista, working on the internal progress of the company, as well as supporting clients with progress in hiring diverse talent. I've worked in academia for 14 years. I was in the business department at Santa Clara University for eight years, and I currently work with San Jose State University in the engineering department now for six years. I'm going to bring my experience and insights to the topic today, hoping you will gain something from it that will assist you in your efforts to create a more diverse organization and culture. So let's dive into the first P, people. Preparing your people, executives, hiring managers, and recruiters. Come up in so many scenarios, I came to the conclusion that the best efforts start from the top. The executive team have to buy in, understand why it's important to the business, and set the example. They have to believe. One of the challenges for practitioners has been to validate the business case. I recently worked with a client that understood the value but wasn't sure how to go about developing the content or presenting it. They needed to show, how val show the value to their executives and hiring managers as to why a diversity effort would be impactful to the business. I was able to share research studies and talking points to present their case. The client was pleased they had resources to help them round out the case to present. It proves that having the data and research to validate your effort does make a difference. Validating the business case will set the table for managers and employees to engage as well, with attracting, recruiting, hiring, onboarding, and retaining diverse talent. Because retention starts in recruitment, it is the first impression and engagement with candidates. Another look at people is all the effort it takes to bring diverse employees on board, on board from recruitment, onboarding, and retention. To make such an investment, you want to ensure you have a substantial return on investment, a win-win for the organization and the employee. An assessment tool for executives that I have used to get a measure of diverse, on diversity beliefs, gifts, and challenges is the Inclusive Leader 360. Just like a performance 360, this 360 assessment for leaders that takes a pulse from the leaders, peers, and subordinates on where they stand on diversity. It is only the beginning of their journey. After the review of the assessment, one-on-one -on -one with the leader, the next step is coaching with a certified inclusive leader coach to ensure gifts are magnified and challenges are worked on for improvement. This is not a shot in the dark for improvement, but a journey, a commitment. I am a certified coach and have seen positive results. The people piece not only includes executives, hiring managers, and employees, but also those responsible on a day-to-day -day basis tasked with the responsibility of recruitment. The frontline recruiters also need to be on board, have their head wrapped around the responsibility and strategy to hire more diverse talent, women, and underrepresented groups of people. They also need the tools in place to support the effort, which we will touch on later. Familiarity, bias, and unconscious bias. We all have familiarity, which is our bias. It is our autopilot response. Another method to influence company culture is to acknowledge our unconscious bias. Since we all have unconscious bias, we are human. It's organic to human nature, some of which keep us safe and others that get in the way of our progress to engage in the best work we can deliver. We have blind spots. So one, in terms of unconscious bias, is the familiar, the safe that we deem true. This may be good thoughts that we have around school, friends, family, food, and our brains, safe means true. It's a conditioned response. But familiar can also mean unsafe, which will lead us to sometimes false conclusions. Um, a snake that scares you, looks like he's ready to strike, a company bad experience, a rival school. In our brains, unsafe can equal a false. Again, there is a conditioned response. I'd like to take a simple, quick quiz on your view. Let's engage in an exercise. I'd like you to look at the slide, state what the colors are, not the words. I'm going to give you a few seconds to do this.
Okay, how was that? This exercise exhibits how difficult it is for us to go against our norm, to state the colors and not read the text. Our minds are wired to do the familiar. According to, Duke, to a study at Duke University, unconscious bias is systemic and dramatically narrows the pipeline for talent. Training, unconscious bias training. 10 to 20% of our journey includes unconscious bias training. It's just part of the journey. It's not the end all solution. Unconscious bias training is designed to identify your personal bias so you are aware of it. Adjust your thinking and behave in a less discriminatory manner. Again, this training is part of the journey. Additional training and coaching is best to create to change in behavior. The bottom line is that everyone is responsible and should have a commitment to diverse talent, which is better for business, better for culture, and speaks volumes to the customer. The best method for success prior to using any tool is to ensure your people are ready to embrace the tools because they have embraced the concepts to succeed. We are going to cover a few process and tools for sourcing, recruiting, and hiring. Let's explore how these elements can improve our hiring. In sourcing, we have creative routes that help us give the opportunity to find better candidates. We can capture the passive candidate with innovative outreach, enrich our information by adding more contact information and more information to the candidate using tools, and share with our hiring managers, which gives value to the process in terms of those hiring managers not having to dig out that information on their own. There are tools that need little to no technical use. What is the tactical strategy for creating a more diverse pool of candidates, which will hopefully funnel to more diverse hires? There are three tools I want to share which assist in the recruiting process. We don't have time to do a deep dive. I encourage you to research tools mentioned today on your own time. There, are, there is a tool that offers three methods which target removing the hiring bias from your hiring process, which include job descriptions, resume review, and impartial interviewing. There has been research that shows that there are problematic words. There is language which is not inclusive and prohibits women and people of color from applying for jobs. Words like rock star and ninja are masculine words which may be a turnoff for some groups of people, but they do continue to be used by many companies. A common practice for college students is to use nicknames to get a call back. As an example, a McKenna might just say her name is Mac, which doesn't connotate gender or race. And unfortunately, it has worked. 70% has had an increase in terms of response when they use their nickname. When candidates submit their resumes, research has shown that resumes with black or female sounding names submit twice as many resumes to get response versus resumes with white or male sounding names. Again, it's what's familiar to those that are responsible for hiring. So I have a couple of examples here I want to utilize um, regarding diversity recruiting and division decision support. The conscious inclusion decision support platform helps users to be more aware of bias with data-driven hiring and a view beyond the noise of unconscious bias. Greater conscious inclusive decision-making ensures a more diverse and inclusive talent pool and workforce. This improved diversity recruiting and hiring in three ways. The first is in terms of attracting talent. Optimize and inclusive job descriptions hire a higher percentage of diverse candidates to each job posting. The second is screen. Blind resume reviews help hiring leaders, reviewers focus on pertinent information for the job rather than being influenced by a candidate's name or school that can cause an affinity bias. And the last module, select structured interviewing, creates an environment for interviewers to be more present and mindful during the interview. 
I'll go into a little bit more detail for each module. During my career, I've worked with many tools. Scientific and research-based data have shown that this tool of job description optimization um, basically takes problematic words within the job description and changes those words to more inclusive words so that more people will be interested in applying for roles. With real-time feedback, you'll write a more inclusive and effective job description that attracts male, female, and underrepresented candidates. On the left, you will see a thumb sign with a score in red, a minus 12 for this particular job description, an opportunity to do better by a score of neutral or green. The words in pink and red in the job description are recommended for change. The words in green are fine. When hovering over the red word, as you'll see at the bottom, the word strong, there are recommendations for more inclusive words, thorough, deep, meaningful, and excellent. Redacted resumes, which are blind screening focus reviews. The redacted resume removes the name, gender, school, and other personal identifying information which are redacted to help evacu evaluators focus on what matters most for job success, core job criteria, rather than fixating on race, gender, or ethnicity. For example, when researchers for the American Economic Review showed study participants completely identical resumes except one fact, one has the name Heidi and one has the name Howard. Howard gets higher ratings. So you see the same effect when comparing a white sounding name with a black sounding name, Greg gets more callbacks than Jamal. By scoring a resume before getting identity information, it helps users ensure an added measure of objectivity. Essentially, the screening works this way. Hiring managers and recruiters receive an email that they have a candidate with resumes to review. They can click the link provided in the email to take, be taken directly to the page where they review and score newly submitted resumes. They can also view a summary report of all candidates who've had their resume view completed with all the scores, no name. If the hiring manager is the one who reviews the resumes, he or she can provide a small feedback, an email feedback to the recruiter about which candidates to advance to interview or disposition. Remember, recruiters take six seconds to review a resume, which is based on familiarity. Diversity is based on objectivity. Structured interviews um, essentially are mindful interviews. This structured interview module provides a very unique feature. It allows you to assign specific questions to interviewers who should know the answers to the questions, which both helps to reduce bias in the interview and make for a better candidate experience because the interviewer is more engaged. Plan interviews to focus on the best indicators of job success. Help interviewers focus on job for needs and criteria. It's easy for interviewers to conduct an effective, objective, and professional interview while being mindful and present with little prep time. The questions are ready to go. A research article in American Psychology cites two biases that affect hiring the best candidate. One is effective heuristic, describes our tendency to evaluate someone based on initial cues like appearance, body language, attitude, and use superficial criteria to make a conclusion about a person's character or potential job fit. Psychologists and sociologists have consistently shown our tendency to select individuals who are like us. We connect more easily with people who share our alma mater or neighborhood or may in turn just interpret, misinterpret those clues as to how someone will perform the job based on how we feel about them. Confirmation bias is when we take those snap judgments and then spend the entire interview seeking out information that supports those conclusions, negative or positive. The structured interview is a deliberate interview process based on the criteria deemed important in the job description and the resume review, qualifications that are critical for the position. Candidates are ranked based on how well they match the criteria. The interview questions are based on job description again and redacted resume criteria. They're moved to hire or reject. The tools I've mentioned have methods to measure their impact, influence on increasing diverse talent hires in the workplace. We will address measurement next. There are many tools that do similar tasks. This is an introduction, a conversation starter. 
So our third area, our third P is progress. Process optimization, define important criteria. HR metrics and analytics, give measure for the tools you use. Optimization metrics, validate the case to use tools that benefit your process. How do you measure process of methods or tools? More often than not, HR is being asked to identify, utilize, and validate the tools and methods they use to move the needle for change. There are various methods, but the one I use to, in my day-to-day -day work is A-B testing. A-B testing is an experiment where two or more variants are chosen at random, and statistical analysis used, used to determine which variation performs better for a given conversion goal. In a nutshell, it's the ability to look at where you are now and where you're trying to go. What is the goal? What is the aspiration you're trying to reach? You take a snapshot of your current state, use the tool, and gauge your progress. For me, it's usually three to six months in terms of a pilot, which gives enough time to recognize significant change or not. When you use a tool, did it create progress towards your goal? And if so, how much progress? Can you measure it? Should you continue to use the same methods, investing more time and money, or should you change your methods and tools and try something different? One famous example of measure is Coke versus Pepsi. Oh, goodness. There we go. Okay, having some technical difficulty here. Just give me a moment. We're skipping a slide for some reason. There we go. Okay, so to wrap up, that wrap up slide did not want to work. So to summarize what we've talked about, first we talked about people. Prepare your employees for success. Gaining executive buy-in, utilizing assessments, building the case for the business value, and unconscious bias training. The next was process. Process tools which support diverse applicant pools, which will lead to more diverse hires. Using hiring tools, platforms that will enhance your ability to attract, recruit, and select diverse candidates. And progress. Progress and ability to validate your methods, the ability to measure, validate, and build a case to use the tools that move the needle. These are proven methods for you to improve your view. They will improve your diversity hiring. Thank you so much for taking the time to enjoy our webinar today. And if you have any interest more in the topic or you'd like to reach out to me with your insights or perspective or methods, please do. I've enjoyed this webinar with you today. All right, that was great, Stephanie. I, uh, and again, go SJSU Spartans, very nice. So I think, you know, this was really important just as it relates to words are very powerful and can mean can cut many different ways as we all know and i think it's important to note that <clears throat> there is there are technologies that are around today as well as just just better understanding of who you're trying to target and how you're phrasing things in the job description and how you're reviewing resumes etc can go a long way to limiting or reducing your biases that we all have and we can't and, and nobody can say that they don't have them because we have them that's just the way it is so if you've got questions for stephanie please send those to support at the talentboard.org and um uh definitely appreciate that presentation don't you think ron i agree i, I thought it was awesome um and i think it's pretty funny it sounds like if uh you want a job working for Kevin, you just have to apply uh, and say you worked at or went to San Jose State, right? That's, your, uh, <laughs> that's right. That's important. You know, that exercise she did at the beginning, that was, that was actually um, very interesting as well. That was. I struggled big time with that. So. I know, right? I mean, there again, it is right there. <laughs> I know, exactly, exactly. All right. So the, we, are, we got another word from our sponsor. So let's take a listen. Today calls for a new talent strategy. A strategy that's agile, grounded in data, future ready, 
and tied directly to business goals. A strategy that prepares people to lead, to learn new skills, and to evolve. Because we know the right talent transforms organizations and becomes a powerful force that helps your business flourish. Talent Solutions. Business and talent aligned. All right. We are now down, folks, to our last session. We're about a minute away from starting. It's going to be about relationship building and how important that is in the recruiting process. And uh, another, a different perspective, too, actually, from a, a unified school, um, Auburn Washburn. And that'll be an interesting perspective. We've had a lot of different industries as well, don't you think, Ron, in this particular few different industries, at least? Yeah, no, I think it's been fun. And just all different perspectives, of course. And so I think that's always the fun, fun to hear um, kind of what everyone took away in terms of, uh, because perception gaps are everywhere where, uh, where you look for them. So it's exactly. definitely been neat to uh, hear from everyone and um, excited for this last presentation well, as well. You, exactly. And, and, and so thank you, everybody. If you made it this far, we are in the last session for today. And then we got a few other comments at the end and then we'll wrap up. So thanks for hanging in there and appreciate you going on this journey with us. And uh, Again, send questions to support at the talentboard.org and then comments as well. And let's go ahead and move on to the last session. Here we go. And so what do we got there, Ron? So final session of the day, everyone. Congrats. Uh, so we're on session seven. Uh, we're going to hear from Brian White, the executive director of human resources and operations at Auburn Washburn Unified. And he's going to be talking about putting the relationship first. So enjoy, everyone. All right, here we go. Hi, this is Brian White. I'm the Executive Director of HR and Operations for Auburn Washburn School District in Topeka, Kansas. I'm also an Executive Board Member on the American Association of School Personnel Administrators for Region 5. I'm excited to talk to you today uh, about some of the things that I have learned uh, from my experience of working with teachers in the education industry. Um, I do have some background prior to coming to the education industry. I've worked uh, in recruiting in both uh, retail uh, and in corporate settings. Uh, and so, um, I've been able to kind of apply uh, some of what I've learned uh, from working in the education industry to help improve um, the practices in recruiting um, and ultimately uh, work to reduce uh, some of the gaps that we had in candidate experience. And my hopes today are to share uh, some of that story and journey with you uh, and share some of the things that we have done so that you can take maybe one thing away today from today's webinar and use that um, in your profession, in your recruiting world, uh, in your organization. Um, or industry uh, to help positively impact that candidate experience. And as we know, uh, candidate experience is extremely important um, during times when we have a tight labor market uh, in North America, um, and especially in education where we have a shrinking um, talent pool for teachers as more teachers leave the profession that are coming in. So candidate experience becomes all the more important um, to making sure that we're not doing things that are shrinking our talent pool, but they can help grow our talent pool. So before I start on today's webinar and presentation, um, the first thing I wanna do is go through a little exercise with you. Uh, and I'd like you now, um, wherever you are in your office, uh, uh, office room, uh, at your home, to just close your eyes. And for one minute, I want you to think. I want you to picture a teacher, a teacher that helped make a positive impact in your life. It might have been an elementary teacher, middle school teacher, junior high, maybe a high school teacher, but think back and think about a teacher that really impacted you positively. And then I want you to think about what made them a great teacher. They probably learned about what was important to you. They probably showed that they cared about you as an individual and they were more than just a number, a grade or an assessment score in a classroom. And they were genuine. They listened to you. They learned how to communicate with you in a way that worked for you. They might have even inspired you to do things that you didn't think you could or that you never thought you'd learn. Does that start to sound like that picture of that person that you had in your mind? And I'm guessing by now, most of you did picture somebody and somebody that helped you in your journey along the way. And that teacher helped identify some of the gaps in your learning or some gaps that you had, and they helped minimize those gaps to help ensure your success. And as recruiters, we can learn from those great teachers and build relationships with candidates 
to positively impact our overall hiring success. So I want to talk to you about some of those lessons that I've learned from working with great teachers. Uh, and some of those lessons have helped to reduce our candidate experience gap in our school district. And so the first gap I want to talk about is teachers learn about what is important to each student. By learning about what's important to each student, that can help them to understand how to connect, motivate, and inspire each student. Next gap is learning how to communicate. Teachers have to learn how to communicate with each student, and it's crucial that they learn how to communicate with each student to positively impact their learning so that they can teach in a way that works for that student. Last gap, number three, is understanding it's more than a number. And teachers understand that each student is an individual and need to work with that individual to build trust and build a relationship so that they can positively impact their overall academic success. And what I'd like to do now is talk to you about how that applies in our world of recruiting. That first gap, learning what's important. There is a gap between what employers provide and what candidates want. And we need to learn what is important to our candidates. The 2019 North American Candidate Experience Research Report shows that 66% of candidates conducted their own research in their job search. And the number one source that they used in their research is a company's career site. That same report shows that the content they want about a company includes company culture and employee testimonials and why people want to work there. In fact, Candy Award winners emphasize company culture 7% more often, employee testimonials 18% more often, and why people want to work at their companies 10% more often than companies that did not win. So when you think about candidates, the number one place they're coming is your company career site. You need to start to think about, does your career site provide the information that's important to your candidates? And as we looked at our school district, we identified some experience gaps that we were having with our candidates and providing them what they were looking for when they came to our career site. And I'd like to talk to you just a little bit about that journey in hopes that you can take something away from our journey and apply it to where you work and to your profession, to your industry, and to your recruiting teams. These things are scalable. So these are things that can apply and you can use regardless of the size of your recruiting team, the size of your company or the size of your organization. So as we started to look, we went through a process in our district of assessing, benchmarking, and researching to learn what's important to candidates in order to be able to rebrand and redevelop our careers page. As we assessed things, we first wanted to look at the analytics of what we currently had. So we looked at the analytics for our page visits. We looked at what was downloaded. We looked at where candidates spent more time than others. And we looked at where candidates came from and where they went to after they left pages. This helped us to understand in our current careers page what people were using and what they valued most and what they didn't value. The next thing we did was we went uh, and did some benchmarking. And we looked at top employers' career pages. We looked at top school districts' career pages. We looked at school districts that were similar to us and their career pages. We looked at our local competition, both in school districts and in industry, in private industry. And as we benchmarked, we started to identify some trends and themes that those top uh, career pages were providing. We also saw things that were innovative and started to think about some things that might be able to help us be more innovative in what we provide uh, to our candidates and improve their candidate experience on our careers page. And then we did some more research. We researched industry best practices. We did surveys. We conducted focus groups. We added questions to our interviews. We added questions like, what are you looking for in a company? What's important to you in a supervisor? What's most important to you in starting out at a company? And as we collected that information, we began to identify what is important to our candidates. And I just have on screen here an example of something that we did um, with our college recruits. So an important part of recruiting teachers is hiring new teachers that are graduating from college and education programs. And so we have four core, four core universities that we attend. And at those universities, we worked with the students in the education departments to gather information and survey them 
to find out what was important to them. And this is an example of one of the questions and the information we found out. We found out that when teachers are first starting out, some of the things that are most important to them are a mentoring program. They want opportunities to collaborate. They don't want to be alone and isolated all by themselves in a classroom. They want to be able to collaborate. They want professional development. They want to continue to learn and grow. They also want support with parents and parent interaction, how to work with parents as a new teacher. These are all things that we realized we didn't have on our careers page and that we needed to add some of this information so that when our candidates were researching our career page, they saw the information that they were looking for and they saw what was important to them. So as we did all of these assessments, analytics, benchmarking, and research, we did end up changing our careers page to help reduce candidate experience between what we were providing in information and what candidates wanted. This is an illustration to share some of the things that we changed as a result. The first thing that we did was we customized our content by market segment. What we realized is not every one of our candidates is coming looking for the same information. And there were certain groupings of what people were looking for that made sense in our market and our industry. For instance, we have a large population of candidates that are interested in substitute teaching. So we created a special substitute teaching tab on our careers website to provide information specific for substitute teaching. You can see other categories as well. We also provided testimonials on our website. We provided that opportunity for our employees to provide a voice to talk about why they love working at Auburn Washburn School District, why they love their job. And it also changes depending on which market segment you're looking at, which candidate market segment you're looking at. We added interactive content. So as you come to our website, we have something that will help interact with candidates when they come in to help provide information, gather information, and start to communicate and build relationships with those candidates. We also wanted to provide a rewarding experience. So we provide advice and tips, things that people can leave from our website and hopefully use even if they aren't interested in applying for working in our district. And all of this together starts to reflect who we are in our culture. And so as candidates visit our careers page, they get that sense of why they wanna work here, what it's like to work here, and also a little bit more about our culture. And that helped to close our gap in the candidate experience for when candidates are researching working in our school district. The second gap I want to talk about is learning to communicate. And there's a gap between the communication candidates want and what employers provide. And we need to learn how to better communicate with our candidates. That 2019 North American Candidate Experience Research Report shows that keeping in touch with candidates throughout the entire process increases overall candidate experience. For example, delivering a rejection over the phone can leave a candidate with an impression 29% more positive than email messages. And keeping candidates informed demonstrates that we respect and value their time. So part of learning about communication is knowing how to communicate and when to communicate. So again, I'd like to share some stories of what we've learned as a school district and some of the things that we've done to help reduce that gap in learning how to communicate with our candidates. The first thing that we understood and learned was centered around our application process. So one of the biggest gaps in ratings between candy winners and all other employers centers around that application process. That has to do with ease of application. It has to do with the ability to see their status. It has to be able to help them know what is happening during the process and what the different steps are during the process and how long it's gonna take and communication during that application process. Only 17% of candidates overall said they applied via mobile, but candy winners candidates said they applied 11% more often than candidates from all companies, resulting in a 32% increase in candidates' willingness to increase their relationship. When you think about candidates' willingness to increase their relationship, that becomes significant because it directly relates to your talent pipeline and to business impact 
because if candidates are willing to increase their relationship, they're going to be willing to apply again. They're going to be willing to refer others. They're going to be willing to continue or to start buying your products and services. So if you have the ability to move the needle on candidates' willingness to increase their relationship, that becomes very important to you in your success in hiring and in your business or industry or company. So with that in mind, we looked at our applicant tracking system and we did not have one that was very mobile friendly. And we did make a change to a different system that allowed us to be able to be more mobile friendly. Our candidates can easily apply via their phone. They can view their status, where they are in the pipeline process. And we streamlined our applications significantly. Instead of asking for all the information and everything up front, we changed to more of an ask for it when you need it philosophy. In 2019, 43% of candidates said it took less than 15 minutes to apply and receive a confirmation. That was up 19% from 2018. So if you have an application process that's taking a longer time, you are differentiating yourself in a way that you may not want to because as you look at applications, you really need to look at your drop-off rate. How many people started an application and then didn't finish? And if you start to see that that drop-off rate is more than you want it to be, you might need to look at streamlining your application process to make it easier to apply and asking for information later when you need it. You might want to make sure that you have the ability for candidates to apply via any mobile device or device. And most of you are probably doing that. But it's important to understand your candidate's experience and how that relates to your candidate pool and ultimately are your candidates finishing applications when they start. Also through the 2019 North American Candidate Experience uh, benchmark research, candidates who were able to ask a chatbot questions consistently rated their candidate experience higher than those who did not. Additionally, candidates who communicated with a chatbot were 80% more likely to increase their relationship with the employer. Again, increasing the relationship with the employer becomes huge in your talent pipeline as well as your business impact. So we did add a chatbot to our careers page. In fact, we were one of the first school districts to do so, and it has provided a huge reduction in that communication gap that our candidates were experiencing with how they wanted to be communicated with and being able to communicate that we didn't provide before. It enabled us to capture information from candidates at their point of interest. And it also allowed us to communicate directly with the candidate via text and email afterwards. And so what happened was we had candidates that were coming to our career page that didn't find what they were looking for and we never knew they came by for a visit. As we learned to engage our candidates while they're at their point of interest on our careers page, we were able to capture some of that interest and information when they were there. And then we were able to follow up on that. And through our chatbot, we were able to start having conversations and talking with people back and forth and answer questions for them that they wanted to know, provide information with them about how to apply, and be able to really start to build that relationship for the talent pipeline. So an example of that specifically is, I don't always have a school nurse position posted, but I do have people that are interested in candidates that come to talk about uh, school nursing and what that's like and if they might want to do that. So if I don't have a school nurse position posted, if a school nurse candidate came to my site, I would never know. But now I do because they provide that information to me and I'm able to start that conversation with them and build that talent pipeline of school nurses for when we do have an open. This chatbot is not the only way to do that on a careers page, but what I would encourage you to do is find a way to build relationships with candidates early, to be able to start that relationship with them before they apply so that you can help them understand more about the job or the journey or the culture of your company, because those are some of the things that they're looking for. Another thing that I've learned from the 2019 North American Candidate Experience Benchmark Research is that candidates who received mobile text notifications during the research process rated their candidate experience 50% higher than those who did not. 
So we have also added some ability within our district to communicate with candidates via text. And as we looked at implementing that, we now have that ability for candidates to be able to start that relationship or that journey with us through their phone by texting. Ultimately, we do ask them to apply online, but we can do that through the texting services. And this has helped us because it's allowed us to place these types of advertising and marketing that you see on your screen here at our schools where we have positions available now. So as parents visit, as grandparents visit the schools, if we have an opening in that school, they can see this at the entrance at the counter with the secretary as they come in. And while they're sitting waiting, this might be something that you do. You might text to learn more about jobs that are available now in the Auburn Washburn district. And this allows us to start that conversation again and build that talent pipeline. But it also provides them with that experience that they get that instant ability to communicate and get information um, and help them understand more about the things that they want and that they're looking for. So by being able to provide text notifications through our app and the tracking system, through our chat bot, um, these are things that have helped us to help close that communication gap. And by better communicating with our candidates in a way that's comfortable for them, this allows for some of that personalization to that candidate and help closing the gap. So the third gap that I wanna talk about is it's more than a number. Candidates want to be more than a number. And there's a gap sometimes between how employers view candidates and how candidates want to be viewed. They want to be able to share their skills and their experience. They want to be considered as an individual and as a person and not as a application or as a number in a candidate yield ratio. So as we look again at the 2019 North American Candidate Experience Research Report, nearly 40% of candidates said they wanted even more information about culture and nearly 30% wanted information on why employees want to work for an employer. Candidates are looking for more than just a job or position. This speaks to culture and belonging and sense of belonging. And we need to provide that experience for candidates that helps demonstrate that they're more than a number. So at Auburn Washburn, some of the things that we've done to address that and help reduce our candidate experience gap are to provide experiences. And so by providing experience, we allow that candidate to feel our culture, to be able to talk to employees about why they work here, and also to be able to understand more about the position, the company, um, and who we are. And I wanted to provide a couple examples of things that we've done to help provide that experience. One of the things that we've done in the college recruiting trail is we've done pop-up teacher chats. And this is essentially where we bring recent graduates back to the universities that are our core universities. and We hold informal events. And this is an opportunity for prospective teachers to come meet with students from their school that are now new teachers. And this allows them to meet in a location that's comfortable for them, it's informal, and we provide, of course, some free refreshments and food. And these student teachers can talk to our new teachers about what's it really like to work at the school district? What's it really like to be a first-year teacher? Um, and as they talk to our teachers, they learn more, not about just only our school district, but they learn about the transition that that first year teacher had to go through from college to now being in their first year of a career. And these become valuable experiences that help those candidates to be able to understand a little bit more about what it's like to work in our school district, what it's like in our culture, and what the job is really like. And this has helped us to build those relationships early with those college candidates in order to help not only build our talent pipeline, but help close that gap in candidate experience to show them that we do care more about them than they're just a number. 
we also have uh, a shortage with school bus drivers in our school districts and also a national problem as well. And so we have done some things as well on that side of the house to help provide experiences. And so we have uh, an example here on the screen as well of a school bus driving experience. And so at our central enrollment at the beginning of the year, um, when all of our students enroll for the school year, we also set up um, a course um, with trainers uh, uh, on our property for parents or anyone interested to come and test drive one of our school buses. Um, and this allows them to experience what it's like to drive a school bus because many people are scared of driving a big yellow bus with a lot of students on it and being responsible for their safety. This gives them a chance to experience that, again, in an informal setting um, and be able to hear from bus drivers and trainers what it's like to drive a bus and start to hear um, about how they had some of the same fears um, about driving a big yellow bus and being responsible for student safety. And this has helped us to increase not only some of our candidate pool, but it also has helped with some of our perceptions for our parents in the community who have taken the opportunity to drive the buses to learn more about what it's like to drive a bus um, in working with their children. And so it's been positive from a public relations standpoint as well. Um, we've even had news teams come and uh, come to the events and drive the bus and broadcast um, their driving experience. So again, this is an opportunity for us to show people that it's more than just we need bus drivers. It's providing experience to them to help reduce that gap and helping them understand a little bit more about what it's like to work here and what our culture is. Another thing that we've done as we've looked at closing that gap is we also understand that the community you live in becomes a part of your culture. And so we have done some things um, to partner with our local chamber of commerce um, to help us in our recruitment process and retention process for young professionals. And so as we look at bringing in student teachers and new teachers into our organization, our city, our chamber of commerce has partnered with us and the Young Professionals Association to provide a top city teachers experience. And so, as our new teachers join, and as we have student teachers, which are like interns, they have the opportunity to participate in the Top City Teachers Program where they have a social event, where they have professional development, where they have a kickoff meeting with the mayor of the city talking about how important education is to our city. And so, as you think about your candidates and treating them more than just a number and providing them an experience to learn about your culture and who you are, you have to remember that they're gonna live in a community close to your business or organization in most cases. And even if they're working remotely, you need to still understand how they're gonna connect with your organization while they live in that location. So there are opportunities to partner with your community to help them be a part of your candidate experience. And that's what we've done with Top City Teachers. And this is something that's helped us that we've used on our recruiting trail to advertise when we go to our core campuses, uh, to be able to share not only um, is Auburn Washburn a great place to work, but Topeka is a great place to work. Um, and this is something that has helped us to close that gap in not only the culture of our company, but the culture of our community. So great recruiters build relationships. Great teachers build relationships. And in recruiting, we need to be that great teacher for our candidates. And we can learn from great teachers to focus on building relationships with candidates. Great relationships are the basis for a great candidate experience. So with that, I'd like to conclude the webinar today. Um, and so thank you all for allowing me uh, to participate in the webinar um, and provide you with a little bit of information about some of the lessons I've learned from working in education that I've used to help close the perception gaps in candidate experience between what we provided as an organization and what candidates were looking for. Provide you with a couple of real world examples that I hope you can take something away from and use in your organizations. And uh, I hope to see you in the future um, at a candy symposium, um, uh, perhaps meet some of you as award winners in the future. So. Thank you and have a great day.
If you have any questions, um, feel free uh, to email me. Uh, my email is whitebry at usd437.net. Um, you can also find me um, on LinkedIn. Uh, I'd be happy to share more information about some of the things that we've done if you're interested in it. Thank you again. Wow, you know, it's, that was a, a, a fascinating way to end. We, we talk so much about bigger bucket industries when it comes to recruiting and candidate experience like technology and, and consumer goods and retail and hospitality and services and financial services and healthcare. And that's great. And I think there's so many things that we learned from those industries that we've learned through our research and companies that have participated as well as have won candy awards. But it, I think it was a nice perspective um, to hear from such a progressive educational organization, don't you think, Ron? I do. I, I think that was fascinating. And then, like you just said, it was crazy fascinating that it was coming from the, the education industry. Which... Yeah, I mean, it's, and it's not that it shouldn't be a surprise to us, right? I mean, I think that we, we do have, we get some of our data from even smaller parts, you know, smaller percentages of industries like education and nonprofit and government and um manufacturing and, and the list goes on. But I think that, you know, these same lessons that we see every year in our research and our data can be applied, of course, across the board. And it was, it was just really refreshing to hear all the great work that he's doing at the, the school that he works at and the school district. So that's, that's exciting. Um, so if you've got questions for Brian, everybody, uh, if you can send them to support at the talentboard.org and we'd be happy to get those to him if you didn't catch his email at the end. We are wrapping up, folks. We totally appreciate your time. We've got a couple of a couple of quick messages that um, we want to convey, and then we are going to let you go. So hang tight. Recruiting is all about conversations. From defining the role internally to sourcing, screening, and interviewing applicants. The Wade and Wendy Recruitment Conversation Platform uses AI to automate recruitment conversations at scale. The first conversation Wendy is tackling is the qualifying screening. Wendy, our AI recruiting chatbot, chats with applicants, learning more about their goals, skills, and experiences. Wendy is available 24-7 and can chat through Facebook, SMS, or our web app, so applicants are able to share their story anytime, anywhere. Hiring teams can review the Wendy chats in their ATS or in our app. Here they can easily see where candidates are in the chat process, review transcripts, and execute next steps. Teams also receive a daily digest showing all the work Wendy's done for the day. Imagine starting every morning with a screened list of applicants ready for your review. Add Wendy, our AI chatbot, to your team and transform your recruiting workflow today. All right. Thanks, everybody, again, for joining us for this great virtual conference that we had. Lots of diverse perspectives and lots of good takes on improving recruiting process from pre-application to onboarding, uh, takes on bias, and um, just a lot of fresh perspectives across industries. So I want to thank all of our presenters again for giving us that information uh, that they shared with us today. And of course, thank all of our sponsors for participating and supporting this program as well. Definitely want to give them a, a shout out. I'm sure you, some of you work with some of these, in, these organizations as well. As we mentioned earlier, we've got a whole bunch of workshops that are coming your way. Maybe your neck of the woods. You can find them on, a, on our site, thetalentboard.org, to learn more about when they are, and where they're at, and how to register for them. They're all free to, to attendees, so definitely check those out. Our research is available to download. Uh, North American report from the latest data set is there with our with the briefs that go along with it. Lots of other resources on our website, um, and then the other regions are coming very soon to be done for 2019. And then one more quick note about the program for you.
name is Tracy Clark. I'm with Symphony Talent, and I'm here with Kevin Grossman of the Talent Board. As most of you know, he's one of our experts in the field. What are one or two kind of key things that you think they really need to stick with this and learn from it? Well, I, I tell you, that at least that lines up with the competitive differentiators that we see in our benchmark research that we do every year. And that, first and foremost, is communicating consistently from pre-application to onboarding. Consistent communication, candidates, that it really always lifts the, the ratings themselves and the overall perception of fairness. Expectation setting throughout the process. Absolutely. What's going to happen before I apply? What's going to happen after I apply? What's going to happen if, if I make it to screening and interview and maybe get the offer and before my start date, what's going to happen? All those things make a huge difference in the experience. All right, again, folks, if you've got questions for us about anything uh, you heard from any of the speakers, uh, as well as anything about the Talent Board Candidate Experience Benchmark Research, please do let us know, support at the talentboard.org. Uh, on behalf of myself and Ron, what'd you think, Ron? We did it, yeah? We did it, what a, what a day, what a awesome seven sessions. Um, Always like to throw the housekeeping uh, back out there, but just so everyone knows, keep uh, on the lookout in your inboxes tomorrow for the recording. Um, and then that'll also include information on how to get your SHRM and HRCI credits, all that fun stuff. But can't believe uh, it's already done. What, a, what an awesome afternoon of candidate experience goodness. Yeah, and we've got not only, we've got two more of these that we're gonna do later in the year. We're gonna do one in June and one in September. So stay tuned for those two more virtual conferences, all the workshops that we're doing. We've always, we always do lots of webinars too, um, many with our sponsors and other influencers in the space. And then we'll of course do our awards galas and the big symposium and awards gala in San Antonio this year on October 26th. That's a great event to go to and lots of great speakers and sessions that we'll start announcing soon uh, in March for the save the date for that. Um, as well as our other global awards galas. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, Ron. And everybody have a great rest of the week, which is now short, kind of, and a great weekend. Cheers, everyone. Thank you.